Talks. I'm Kathy, and here we are. We have Mihaela, Kostya, and Jesse. So, guys, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. <laughs> good. All good. good. Ready to, to talk about chess and chess teaching and uh, everything we've got prepared. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. So, our first topic let's start from um, Online Chess Olympiad. So, yeah. um, who do you support? Do, do you, anybody had some favorites there or not? Yeah, supported South Africa mostly, but uh, <laughs> you know, um, we didn't exactly bring home the points. Um, I remember, who was it? Uh, we, we scored some points. We, we took some points away from some, some top teams, but I think one was because of a disconnection. So the internet was a huge issue especially when it came down to the final. Yeah, that's true. Your final or the final final? The final final when, <laughs> oh, the final when, final. when South Africa made it to the final final, you know? <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't sure. Yeah, the internet was like a huge, huge thing. Who were the other teams in your in your bracket, Jesse? Um, we had Hungary, Spain, Netherlands, um oh, sounds like a wow. good bracket yeah. ukraine that's tough. yes we had <laughs> team in the bracket yeah i, think I our... wasn't there that's not my fault <laughs> <laughs> i think our board one scored against your board one only because of the connection so that was, that was okay <laughs> yeah we, we took the one but yeah it's it's unfortunate because i mean when you dc then you lose the game and if you dc more than once i think you get disqualified and it's mm -hmm. not really your fault yeah i was of course rooting for ukraine we actually beat china uh so we scored uh, two, two matches where were a draw and there was the armageddon our kirill shevchenko was playing uh, i forgot the name of his opponent and he actually was supposed to win the the game previously and then we would win the match but then it was a draw and there was armageddon he won the armageddon and we beat china and then well then well united states happened oh no <laughs> What was the score yeah, against yeah. US? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have everyone here. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's Come really on, what is funny. your apology, Costa, for, for beating you? <laughs> I, I still feel bad about the time the US beat Ukraine in like the real Olympiad, like the three and a half half, where it was just enough for them to like get the bronze, but Ukraine had been doing like so well the whole tournament. It was kind of tragic as well. So mm. I'm still sorry about that one too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, come on, we were joking. That's sports, of course. That's yeah. Yeah, actually, um, Daniel Naroditsky said something really interesting. He said like uh, on on the Perpetual Chess podcast. I don't know if you guys have have caught it, but um, he basically said like wanting to beat your opponent is the ultimate sign of respect. It shows that like you take them seriously enough that like you want to beat them uh, and i thought that's pretty cool actually yeah like trying your best against someone putting your full effort is is definitely like a show of respect mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense yeah <laughs> painful it, it is painful but that sounds like a truth to me yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. and katie mm -hmm. who are you supporting in the olympiad uh, i was supporting of course georgia but the um they didn't make it long, so then my second favorite team was Poland, because that time I was in Poland at the chess tournament, uh, and um, uh, I was kind of part of it, and they were supporting Polish team, and they made quite good tournament, and made um, uh, they got bronze medal, and Whoa. it was uh, it was very yeah. nice, very nice That's to cool. be. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, they, they made a big deal in actual Olympiad last year. They were doing fantastic job and they are becoming stronger every day, I think. Shared of first fourth places, but they were the unlucky, <laughs> unluckiest team out of uh, out of four. They they got fourth place. Yeah, they did amazing at the I don't just Olympiad. Uh, mm -hmm. Two years ago already? It was two years ago. Wow, 2018, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And what about this uh, shared championship, like shared 
champions. <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I, I don't even I, know how to say that. It's like it's not <laughs> happening often. <laughs> yeah, Should I wasn't sure if that would be too controversial to bring up or not. <laughs> what is your opinion on it? The fact that there were two champions decided by the FIDE president? Yeah, I think it's 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 uh, it's very positive thing. <laughs> like we have too many people happy. Uh, but it's something uh, new for us. We don't know what thoughts we might have, right? It's something really unusual for, for chess players not to have a winner, but to have two winners. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's something unusual, I would say. Yeah, yeah I would say it's, I, I don't know all the details. So what was the exact reason for the disconnect? Apparently it was not player's fault, right? It was some sort of bug that was not foreseen before the tournament has started. So you had to, like extraordinary situations, demand extraordinary measures, and I'm guessing that's what happened. I, I know that at least in the United States, from what I'm uh, watching on uh, some shows, that I'm, they always make fun of uh, how can you have a draw, like American football, for example, and they compare it to European soccer. Uh, like, draw? What the hell? <laughs> you know, just play until you find the winner. And we're like, 0-0, zero, zero. that's a great match. No goals were scored, but I enjoyed the 90-minute match. Mm -hmm. And they're like, how can you not have a winner? <laughs> so for them, I, I would say, like, uh, tie in the final is like ridiculous the tie in one game is ridiculous for for most us sports fans i would say but in a knockout tournament that's unthinkable i would say mm -hmm. did you yeah see i think the... most fans like just want to see um they, they just want to see like the games were played honestly i think like if you just like ask the players apparently the players weren't really consulted on what they were willing to do um you know because some of the players they have like an advantageous position or they're like low on time they're like some factors but players for the most part are willing to just replay the, the crucial games from the start. And I think fans like would probably just want to see the action end in like chess rather than a decision <laughs> like made by a, like a judge. So it was unfortunate, but like, yeah, it, this whole thing has been weird, you know, with COVID playing online, <laughs> it's like the first year <laughs> this is happening and we're all yeah. scrambling. So of course there's going to be like these insane situations that no one knows how to, how to deal with. Yeah, I also have this kind of feeling that for the first time, if we, we're going to have an online Olympiad, uh, there will be written rules. Like, now it's very hard to judge any anybody, right? Like, can judge. Let's call it a precedent. And after that, most of this stuff would be written in the regulations, and there would be less confusion. And I think that's, at least that's one valuable lesson to take away from it. Mm -hmm. Jesse, what do you think? I mean, no one could have um, uh, at least anticipated the kind of, you know, problems because you can't disconnect OTB. I mean, you could probably fall asleep. <laughs> There's no disconnecting. So probably a no. There been... could be, in, in a way, 2014 Olympiad. Yeah. In a way, uh, people thought there was a, a terror attack threat and started running away from the playing hall. And they had to. I I wasn't there. I just 2014 Tromsø Olympiad. Yeah. Um, there was some yelling or some sound, and people thought it could be a, a terrorist act, and they started running. And yeah. I don't remember how they figured uh, handled that, but there was a confusion like that even on actual tournament. Mm -hmm. yeah. Unforeseen situation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's... It was fine. There was no nothing was uh, yeah. there, but people were scared and started running. Mm -hmm. I mean, the worst thing, I think, and I, I don't want to change the, the vibe of the, the conversational topic right now, but I know some pretty bad things have happened during the round of the Olympiad. I think someone um, actually passed away, if I'm yeah, not mistaken. Yeah, because of heart attack, yeah. Heart mm -hmm. attack, yes. Um, so a few deaths have happened at the Olympiad. So, you know, chess is a very dangerous sport. You better watch out, guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know someone um, passed away in their hotel room, and then during mm. the round, and his opponent actually resigned, like in honor of him, right? I think mm, that was really the story. Nice. That is nice. Yay, chess based articles, you know. <laughs> um, but... All right, yeah, let's can talk we about now bring people a chess going sports? crazy uh, uh, of chess. You know, how many strong players went went nuts at the end of uh, as a, nuts is not a good way to put it. Um, <laughs> what is the what is the good way to put it? You know, like. People going crazy because of chess, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. 
lot of players, yeah, they struggle with their mental health. <laughs> Thank you. That's the proper way to say it. <laughs> Bobby Fush. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, so chess is a dangerous game. Take Please. our lovely wooden chessboard back. <laughs> <laughs> and analyze the most beautiful game yeah. which just happened and played at Online Chess Olympiad. This is Daniel Verney uh, versus Alexei Shirov. Mm -hmm. uh, and I Alexei Shirov actually the got the prize of uh, Gazprom. Mm. And it's it's really beautiful game. So mm -hmm. let's once again check and uh, analyze it. Yeah, you're welcome to flick through the moves. Um, are you able to make the moves on the board? Who you ask? <laughs> oh, yes. yeah, sorry. OK, there we go. Perfect. <laughs> just, just checking. Well, there we go. Um, yeah, I don't know who wants to show the game, but Shiro's a genius oh, and has been for, for a while. And now it's like it's no different. <laughs> still, and still same old Shiro. For me, it's shocking how he can breathe life into Slav, you know, into some positional stuff. Suddenly there's fire on the board, right? Out of nowhere, he can create fire out of nowhere. It's unbelievable. Can we get that that exact fire position where, where he made a magic on the board? Yeah, um, that was this one. Ooh. Uh, let's maybe see all the moves slowly. If, if, oh, sure. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, this is actually a pretty typical line, yeah. Yeah. Um. Yes, very common theory with Queen B b8 and, and all of that definitely nervous uh -huh. so still theory until until here I until think, move um, 40 i think <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> no, i think kidding, somewhere right? around here know. probably like queen b8 yeah i'm not sure exactly when the players left left theory but actually this was the first moment that i thought was really interesting what did you think about this move michaela queen g3 it's like the queen is the worst uh, defender and the worst uh, piece to blockade anything, but apparently it's a good decision to stop G4 <laughs> with the queen, you know? You can't think of a worse piece to do that job. Okay, the king, yes. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> anyone can kick the queen away. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and yet it was a good decision, you know? Interesting. Yeah, the queen played a, a lot of roles in this game, including D. I I don't think the point was to attack the pawn, actually. The point was to stop G4. Oh. I, I'm not sure. OK, the pawn is hanging, <clears throat> but maybe I am willing to lose it, you know? Just open the G file and then throw H5. There could be a very dangerous attack. Yeah, that, that queen was a door stopper. Yeah. Yeah. So like, why goes rook G1? And then like. Rook C4. Here was the fire starts. Yeah. Yeah, this is beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. It's like take it if you dare. <laughs> it's like Petrosian style. Yeah, and just like in that game, you're not supposed to capture it. I think. Yeah, and here if I capture this yeah. one, like probably it's um No, I would take with the D pawn and then push B4, I think. Oh, okay. And then start start push rolling those pawns. I think that could be a better idea. Yeah. With, Either you know, way, black like gets a decent attack. Right. Seems to me. So f4. f4. A That's a weird. White decided to trap the queen. I'm guessing. Yeah. But uh, how can you trap the queen? I don't see a trap yet. Do you see how to win the queen? I don't see it yet. But that's the only move that makes sense. Like the only reason to play this move is to trap the queen. Mm -hmm. So here, rook c8, okay, just follows up. Like <laughs> nothing's going on, queen d1. <laughs> so the rook is hanging, the queen is trapped. It's all fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he's getting the last piece into the game. <laughs> knight e2, queen g4. And uh, okay, here white goes knight c1. Uh-huh. 
The next so I guess this is a position to talk thing. about. Yeah, the, the, the next move is the last thing you would expect to see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we could just talk about, like, how do we find tactics at the board, you know? Because no one told Shirov, like, <laughs> he has a nice move here, you know? Yeah. He, he just had to, he had to, like, kick himself and, and figure it out on his own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly the situation when uh, you don't have the position on the board at home when you have to find a tactic because, you know, they have, you have to find a tactic, but he sensed that, that there is something here and there can be some tactics here and he, he, he made this um, happen on the board. So, um, but what was actually, um, what is the weakness here for, for, for white? Let's start with it here. Yeah, I think the king is weak, right? So black black's king is totally safe and white's king is exposed in a sense. And you have to know a typical pattern here. Uh, the knight and the rook uh, checkmate on the h file. Usually we see that knight e7 check, king goes to the corner and then mate on the h file. That's usually the, the way uh, to, to, uh, to give, but I never seen this one on, on the queen side. So let's maybe play the move to to see what, uh, if you don't know this idea, there's zero chance you're gonna find it. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, White's main weakness here is that he's not sure of, so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, actually it's quite a difficult position because if Queens get exchanged, Black White would have two bishops, right? Um, White would have two bishops, there's no attack anymore. So Black has to act right now, knight to e4. Beautiful. Wow. When if I you checked this seen the position, move. Yeah. I checked exact this position and I thought that black made queen g4 as the final move. I didn't know the game. Oh. I just knew the position is like, whoa, this is crazy, queen g4. <laughs> <laughs> but then I found out about knight d4 and it's even more crazy yeah. to, to play like knight from f6 with defense the queen and g4 to play on e4. That's true, actually. Okay, I, I had the same thought when I saw the position first, because yeah, everyone just kind of, I think a lot of it just saw it on Twitter. <laughs> and uh, yeah, my first thought was like, oh, last move was queen f5, g4. And I'm like, okay, that's a cool trick. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like typical uh, deflection tactic, right? Like, yeah. nice checkmate. But yeah, actually, 94 makes it like much more uh, special. It's like uh, mm -hmm. much harder to find it in this way. Yeah, but yeah. we're talking as if it's so so natural, like knight to e4. So what's like if queen takes the full queen is hanging, right? It's knight takes d2 check, correct? So yeah. king goes somewhere, let's say to a1, and what do you do next? Who needs a queen? I just ate the queen for a bishop, and now b3 is the move, and rook is coming to to a4, and it's not the end of the line, I would say, right? Is there something that still like can save white here? Bishop b1, I would say, is a try. So rook a4 is coming. So if bishop takes, if bishop takes the rook, oh, hold on, you're should have promoted the line, right? Knight e4, queen g4, knight f4, queen g4 takes king a1, b3. So if bishop takes rook, take... white is what queen and rook for just two pieces, right? Yeah. And actually we can remove the, the pieces on d7 and e7. Nobody cares about them anymore. <laughs> the rook a4 is unstoppable. This is just beautiful. Yeah. Look at these low lyrics on g1 and h1. <laughs> <laughs> White is not even close to getting to flex king. But uh, it's so, I still don't get it. Like there's bishop to b1 move. You have to see this one. Because uh, you're the full queen, you're full queen down. Bishop right. to b1. What's the yeah. continuation? Rook a4. Take, and then the other rook is coming? Is that the rook a4? So I believe the idea it? is to throw in uh, knight c5. Hmm. Could you not wow. take on c1 first and then play rook c4? But then the rook is not coming. Yeah. I take rook oh, c1. I have third rook one. 
yeah. Oh, yeah. You have to give a check. So if bishop here then takes, right? Sorry, if bishop a2, rook takes c1, takes yes. c1, right? And that's the mate. But what if bishop goes to, what if knight goes to a2? It's still not obvious. Seems like black is not attacking anymore. Now pawn takes. Knight b3 mate take. is coming. Bishop has to take. Okay, now at least there's perpetual for black. Knight b3, king b1, knight d2, king a1. But knight c5, this is just unbelievable. And if takes, rook takes c5, and then rook takes a2. This is this is like unstoppable. This is beyond my like if I push the b pawn, it's bishop f6, mate. Whoa. <laughs> This is just, uh, this is just, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, question, I'm wondering I'm if um, maybe would it also work if black just played knight c5 uh, in this position? Quiet no. move knight c5 first. Yeah, then white is taking. Oh, hold on, here, takes. If we take on a2. Bishop c2, that's the difference. So you gotta ah, take knight because first. Because bishop c2 attacking the rook and stopping yeah. knight b3 mate. Oh, okay. Yeah, captures first. Just just take that knight and then. <laughs> take it also knight simplifies knight the position for you to calculate. So it's so hard to calculate with all these pieces on the board, right? Yeah, but you have to it's see like knight c5. Yeah. You have how to how many moves he calculated actually here from knight e4? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten moves. It's whoa. I'm <laughs> guessing my guess is that he may have seen a perpetual. And so, for example, if I would see a perpetual, I would still go for it because, uh, and then maybe I have something else. Mm -hmm. And it's actually and very is... good, very good advice to take. Like, uh, in this kind of uh, positions maybe there is something that you cannot calculate but yeah let's let's try why not draw is also a result right <laughs> and not to be afraid of um, to sacrifice queen and make all this crazy stuff on the board it's just so beautiful <laughs> yeah absolutely and how did the game end? So we went into sideline of a sideline of a sideline, right? So <laughs> what, which must have been calculated. There's just, you have to, it's not like he just gave away the queen. No, he definitely must have, Bishop B1 is a move that uh, you have to see and you have to see the continuation. Yeah. So on, um, yeah, on 94, white ended up going Bishop E2. So not, not taking the sacrifice, mm -hmm. uh, black played uh, queen f5, bishop mm -hmm. d3, knight f6. Mm -hmm. And then tragically, I would say white kind of blunders into the same exact trick with g4. Allowing knight takes g4, rook takes g4, and now, of course, <laughs> queen takes g4. <laughs> Much worse. Okay, but there's no knight on d7 anymore. So what's the difference? The back rank, uh, the problem, yeah? Uh, yeah, now there's no knight on d7, knight no rook on, on g1. But there's no rook on g1, which is kind of important. Yeah, yeah it's also very important because that knight can, might be hanging on c1. Yeah, and exactly how the uh, game ended. Right away. Mm -hmm. uh, with the mate coming with the pawn. Yeah. Really a shame he didn't allow the final position. I mean, yeah. <laughs> really? what are you doing? When, where he resigned. Like rook takes c1. Yeah. Uh, I think this is Nigel's short speciality, yeah? To to let his opponent checkmate him if he enjoyed the combination. I think so. Right? Yeah. I next think time, I salty. Next, next time when I get a when I receive a beautiful checkmate, I'm gonna let that happen. Hopefully me that too. would Let's be never. It. Hopefully Let's that would be never. But... <laughs> <laughs> a fact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it should be kind of like a sportsmanship thing. Like if if your opponent is like mating you, then you mm -hmm. just allow the mate. Not like you know you down a rook, you play until checkmate. That's annoying. Don't do that. <laughs> but yeah, if it's like especially if it's a nice mate. Yeah. Yeah, I never thought 
this way, like when I say that I have already losing position and it's obvious that you're gonna say it, uh, I, I just resign and I, I, I think that's the polite way to end the game. But after seeing these beautiful checkmates, I think it's, and, but when I'm, I want to mate um, my opponent, I always want not to resign. Like I want <laughs> him to let me do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next time I'll. I'll and sometimes I just forget. <laughs> my opponent. Sometimes I just <laughs> forget that just giving, letting the checkmate. So you're you're usually disappointed, right? Yeah. You don't think about something beyond the game itself, and then you're like, oh, why didn't I? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's too bad. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if your opponent resigns, just be like, no. Make a move. <laughs> yeah, don't I don't me. accept your resignation. <laughs> no, 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 make a move. Make a move. Yeah. <laughs> There's some story about some story about uh, you know uh, back in the day, and I'm guessing nowadays as well. Uh, some people um, buy games, buy norms. So let's let's talk about that too. That's kind of a controversial Buying topic. norms? Too. Do you go to yes. Craigslist and just type in GM norm or something? No, no. For example, it's the last round and if you win, um, you get a norm or a title and uh, your opponent can even approach you and say, you know, like maybe, you know, we can have Oof. an agreement or something. There are some uh, even tournaments organized just specifically for one player. Oh. Uh, anyway, but the story that you mentioned, I cannot accept your resignation, is I don't remember the names at all, but the story goes like this. So the um, um, a player, a final round of closed tournament, whatever GM norm I think it was, and the player needs a win, and his opponent is uh, anticipating an offer. So because he's only thinking about like, yeah, I'm going to earn some money, I'm going to lose, I'm going to earn some money. And the, that guy who needs a win is not approaching at all. Uh, he's just, he's just, he has no, no interest in that. But he doesn't realize it. The guy cannot even think that it is possible to just play and try to win without even trying to organize the win. So they play and uh, the player who needs a win doesn't play a very good game. He ends up in a worse position. The position is getting worse and worse. And the other player is thinking that, uh, oh, my price is getting higher now. <laughs> you know, if I have to lose such a good position, maybe maybe my income would be higher now. And then, so it's getting better and better. Now he has a winning position, and his opponents just stops the clock and resign. And he says, "I cannot accept your resignation. We can still make a deal. <laughs> that will actually what? happen. You can, we can still make a deal." <laughs> oh my gosh. It really happened on the chess Yes, world? it really happened. Yes, it that's really funny. happened in chess world. Wow. I can Google the names, but that's a true story. We can still make a deal. <laughs> <laughs> so you can really exchange your ELO for money. That's interesting. <laughs> okay. Well, so how brave is he to do this at the chess room? No, way? it was long, long time ago, but uh, it was considered <clears throat> normal in that uh, specific area or tournament. I don't know. That's a true story. Cannot accept your resignation. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. Uh, do we have uh, like other tactic uh, played in uh, um, at online chess tournament? Maybe we can also uh, show that and discuss a little bit. Yeah. Is that uh, Kostya? We're going to check out your game. Yeah. Um, I I just found like a cool. A cool combination. I just got it off chess base. There were like top ten games from the Olympiad, and I was like, okay, I'll look. I'll look through this. And uh, so this is the game uh, between two GMs, Antonius uh, Pavlidis and uh, Lubomir Fatashnik. And um, actually, it's not exactly the critical moment, but I'll I'll put it up for for people to to solve once we once we get there. But I just thought it was an instructive moment because we're all like we're coaches, right? And we're, we're trying to uh, teach people how to, how to kind of like make smart decisions. Um, here, like, it seems like a very messy position, but white has uh, some initiative and plays this move, um, bishop e4, uh, which as you guys will notice, or later if you check the, uh, the game yourselves, is not not the top engine move. But to me, it looks like a very, very strong and, and logical move because he trades off black's light squared bishop and on the previous move had white gone let's say pawn takes g6 which also looks very natural opening up the rook 
like its bishop takes g6 and is defending everything on the light squares. Uh, so White anticipates this, trades off important honestly, light square sorry to defender. interrupt you. Yeah. But honestly, I would not have played this bishop e4 because I would be scared of leaving this rook on f1, not protecting, and then hmm. leaving the kid, uh, not kid, king, so, <laughs> so alone on h1. No, I'm with you. Bishop e4 looks like a very risky move when you have a bishop on g2. Yeah. Um, that's why I found it instructive, just because it's not not a move a lot of us would make, uh, just on positional grounds, maybe. Um, but it turns out really well. Black goes uh, bishop takes e4, knight takes e4. Now white is again threatening uh, f takes g6 along with uh, knight g5. Uh, so black tried maybe only defense queen c8. And uh, now it's white to play. So I'll leave it up for the uh, the audience to solve. Try to find the winning winning line here. Oh my um, gosh, this is one of the contenders for the brilliancy prize, no? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I remember seeing this game. Yeah, yeah I remember something. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. No spoilers. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm not gonna say. Anything. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. It. <laughs> we, we wouldn't show it if it was not beautiful, right? <laughs> yeah. Spoiler alert! It was actually my game. No, it wasn't. <laughs> that'd be, that'd be crazy. <laughs> that'd be amazing. Game. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> no, I, I had some decent games. Mihailo, what's your? Oh. Do you have like an immortal game or like an immortal combination you always think of? That you've played myself mm -hmm. uh i have some really good games but uh so that my immortal one that's a good question if i had to pick one <laughs> i have it's not very beautiful but uh, the the highest rated opponent i have beaten over the board in classical chess was vugar gashemov in 2010 10 years ago and he was 2760 or something number six or five in the world and i won with black and it was a very interesting story behind it and there was a nice combination but it was not like a beautiful one and uh, i noticed that uh, in many of my games i am uh, uh, not giving a checkmate I'm the one receiving it, and uh, <laughs> i don't like where this is going so i'm quite good <laughs> in a dynamic chess so just playing um, actively with my pieces, but I hardly have any uh, uh, combination that ends in a checkmate. Like two years ago, I had a very nice uh, game when I sacrificed material for, for the attack, exchange, and then uh, just exchange and one or two pawns down. And I had complete domination in the position and I was attacking the king and it ended up in a beautiful combination, but it was not perfect. So it was... Yeah, if I had, I cannot pick one game. It's like each one has some sort of a flaw. I have many beautiful instructive games, but that ends in a checkmate. No, fortunately not. And Katzi, what about you? Do you have a favorite game of your own? <laughs> it's actually funny, sorry, because uh, today um, uh, one of my friends, probably um, uh, many knows him, is Grandmaster from India. Uh, Sahaj Grover wrote, sent me a photo uh, of um, of our game, which happened uh, in 2006, and we are small kids. He's smaller, <laughs> and we're playing, <laughs> and it happened. Uh, uh, I was with black pieces, he was with white, and um, uh, we played um, uh, Rouser. Rouser. Uh, I play Rouser and he played too. And it ended like you won the game. It was very bad, very bad memory for, for me. And then we played a uh, second game, I think like four years ago. Uh, again, I was with Black, he was uh, with White. He had like very big advantage. And then I found crazy queen sacrifice on B3. Like I just played mm -hmm. Queen B3. I didn't even took a pawn, just, just queen b3, it was <laughs> oh crazy, crazy sacrifice. But uh, yeah, we were talking about this, it was so funny. And uh, I have to I have to check in my games if I have it. Uh, I hope I saved it. Yeah. But it was something that, um, that I had in my mind, but it's just a coincidence that we, uh, we just talk about this today in the morning. <laughs> 
That's cool. What about you, Jesse? What's your immortal game? Ooh. Um, it was back in the 1800s. Um, <laughs> I'm, like that. I'm just kidding. I'm not a vampire. Uh, in 2014, I played in the World Youth. And I I have a habit of either, either having a very good first game or really bad first game. And this one was a good one. World Youth played in Durban, South Africa. And my first round opponent was a player from India. She was rated about... 500 points elo above me i was 1600 and she was 2100 so that was really cool and i played the scotch gambit against her and that's probably really really risky with with white and somehow she didn't know the line that i played and i ended up sacrificing just about all my pieces uh, for the attack and it was very enjoyable i can't say the same for the rest of the tournament but that one <laughs> will be etched in my memory forever <laughs> Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. At least I have that. <laughs> yeah. Last year, oh, do you have, yeah, do you have oh. some, some game like that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have one game that I consider like my immortal game. Um, because I felt like I came up with a lot of like tactics and it was like a very, it's like a long game, but like the tactical sequence was like maybe 15, 20 moves. Um, and uh, I had to like continually, like, like first it was like, I was willing to sacrifice a pawn, then like exchange and like peace. Then I was like down a rook at some point, but like the attack was like objectively very correct, which uh, was important to me. <laughs> um, but the game was special because my opponent was a kind of an uncomfortable player for me who would like always steer the game into very close positions. And he really loved like close positions with black. He would play the French and like the old Benoni and uh, just slowly outplay me every time. <laughs> so, and this game I was playing black and I'm like, okay, whatever happens, I'm just going to keep, I'm going to open the position. Uh, and yeah, I felt like, felt like I played like a Mickey tall. <laughs> <laughs> you make it sound oh. like a lot of players had your number there, Costa. <laughs> Because I remember last time you were saying about the whole psych psychological factor, even if you're better than some players, uh, just have this psychological hold on you. So, yeah. Was it the same one? No, different guy. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I overcame it, right? I overcame it. That's kind of. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Interesting. You always you always talk about psychology in chess. That's uh, very interesting too. Have you ever played poker, Costa? <laughs> uh, I have. Yeah, I like poker. Okay. Were you successful? Because there's lots of psychology there as well, right? No, I never played like that much. Um, but mainly just because I felt like it it would just take too much time to like take it mm -hmm. seriously, mm -hmm. and uh, and I've never really loved the idea of like gambling. Uh, especially against people who like maybe aren't super financially responsible yeah and then like they go to the casino so i just didn't like that whole environment whatsoever but i love the game of poker mm -hmm. it's a really cool game yeah, yeah. Um, i've always wondered what percentage of luck is involved in poker a uh, poke poker <laughs> poker yeah very very little i would little. say luck. very little yeah very little but luck, isn't yes. uh, are you are you being the sarcastic? higher you go the oh. no no uh, okay maybe in the low levels yes but uh, otherwise it's uh, mathematics and uh, i have a friend who played professionally poker he got mm, i wouldn't say he got rich but uh, he was quite successful and he said that uh, um he had like you have to online poker i'm not saying over the, I, i'm not i don't i have no idea what's going on over the actual table but in online poker there's lots of calculation required so you have all these stats on each player you have five to ten different numbers which represent different situations in the in each part of the game and you have to quickly calculate the probabilities given the hand that you know given the statistics that your opponent has so you have to like do it very quickly in your mind and uh, sometimes you can just play without your cards just by those numbers Oh. Just it, it may not matter what cards do you have. You can yeah. beat the player just by their statistics. So, for example, you have the statistics that usually 90% he uh, drops the hand if you do this. 
uh, before you open your uh, before uh, the cards are even open yet in the beginning and you can just just using those odds whatever you have doesn't matter you have the stats and you follow the stats and you can just win by by doing that so there's lots of mess there yeah, you that's crazy. Do that in and psychology. Game. I had yeah. no idea. I thought it was all about me neither. <laughs> the hand you're being dealt. I thought the cards obviously speak. No, there are some stats. You know, here you know that if he makes a bet before any cards are revealed, he usually uh, drops the bet if you overbet him in like ninety percent of cases. So you just always overbet him, and if he uh, just follows, you just that's it. I'm done. You know. So, but in ninety percent, you would take his bet. And in that 10%, you just lose whatever you put on the table and that's it, you do nothing. And this is a winning strategy because you know that these are his odds. And the next level is that you know that he knows your odds and like it's ridiculous. Lots of psychology in the same. You know that he seizes your stats. You're aware of your uh, you're aware of your stats, and he's mm -hmm. doing that. And you have to hold on. Is he doing that because his cards are good, or he's doing because of my? So this is like really deep stuff. Mm -hmm. But in chess, I think luck, luck is very important. It played a, a great part for in my chess career, and I mm. think it's it's um, yeah. bigger percentage that uh, that in poker, mm -hmm. as you explained. I have no idea about luck in <laughs> poker. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> Clearly, I thought that. Uh... So how important is to be lucky at chess? Chess, mm -hmm. chess game and where this luck comes from yeah i think you deserve that luck it's not like if you know your opponent the, the problems of your opponent if you're push if you're pushing 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 and your opponent collapses mm -hmm. a lot of people would say oh it's a one move blunder no it isn't you push the whole game and finally your opponent collapsed but if you just look through the with stockfish or whatever oh it was just one mistake may not have been the case maybe you've uh, you've done some work to deserve they say that i think karyakin is uh, he always gets lucky when when defending he can save some really bad positions or at least a few years back uh, minister of defense that was his title i think <laughs> and uh, and uh, and people oh he got lucky no he didn't <laughs> He was just very good at defending, seeking mm -hmm. all the chances, and finally the opponent makes a mistake and he can secure the game. Yeah, yeah. I remember um, when uh, when we had chess camps. It was usually before uh, European Youth and World Youth Championship. Uh, we were talking, just talking, and uh, one of our friends said, "Like, oh, that's." She's very lucky. She's just lucky, like she's winning mm -hmm. games because of her luck. Uh, and then our coach, um, he's a very smart person, said that it's it's just not comes like this, you know. <laughs> luck come here. She works hard and she, then she tries at the chess game, mm -hmm. and she deserves this luck. And that's mm -hmm. it. and there was something that I re remembered, and I always had in my head that she worked. And then she fight it until the last moment. It actually was true. Like when it was so abused position that um, her opponent was um, just, you know, playing a4, a5, a6, a7, and then queen. It was so simple. She was still playing. And once her opponent did not uh, queen and asked, uh, offered a draw in just very winning position. I'm talking about <laughs> the beginning level of chess. I think it was some psychological issue too that uh, the opponent thought it was she was very strong and she just offered drug it was also a result for her and that's something that uh, i always have in my mind that people actually work hard to be lucky and fight hard to be lucky hmm. mm -hmm. I, I can say the, the the opposite story maybe about being unlucky yeah please. so i had this uh, uh, for for many many years i was so uh, let's say you play a game and then you blunder right then you blundered something relatively simple normal so, saturday <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, I, i'm talking about classical long chess and uh, i would like oh or or i i played a bad game or and i would say oh it happens with the two more letters before it so the, that was uh, eh, what you're gonna do you know everybody's blundering so that and but then at some point when i grew up a little bit i saw that hold on a second 
Uh, mm, I didn't get enough sleep that night because I did something uh, fun in the afternoon or evening, you know. Uh, I didn't do my tactics. I uh, didn't prepare so much. I wasn't too focused over the game. So it's always easy to say, oh, it's a bad day at the office. It is much better to, to ask yourself, okay, what did I do wrong so that this uh, happened? It was not supposed to happen. And you say, okay, I should get my sleep. I should do some tactics. I should be more focused. And then you you do your you make your luck so that you are unlucky much less than than if you. And I was always like, oh, it happens. Could have happened to anyone. And it was happening very often. And it's not a proper way to deal with the problem. First, you try to do whatever you can. And then if it still happens, then you say, okay, I did my best. But if you cannot say I did my best, then you cannot say, oh, it was an unlucky day. Mm -mm. Try to fix something. Yeah. You're talking about taking responsibility. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really powerful, especially in chess. I mean, people, um, I think, waste a lot of mental energy thinking about things that they have no control over. Uh, for example, uh, online cheaters. Like, mm -hmm. you have no control if the person on the other side is cheating. But if you drive yourself crazy for it, you'll like, you won't enjoy the game. Exactly. Um, or like what your rating should be like ultimately that's not really up to you you know sometimes you just run into opponents that are underrated or are like uh, have a weird style and just kind of outplay you and the rating doesn't necessarily match your strength it just matches your results and your results are what they are for whatever reason what you can control is now what you do forward like your actions like how you take care of your brain and your body and your chest and Everything Mahila was saying, I think, is yeah, totally spot on. Hmm. Oh. Actually, I, I got, I was always uh, aiming for 2600 ELO, and I was 2550, 2590, 25. So I was always like, for me, 2600. I was always, oh my God, I want 2600 ELO. <laughs> and then I got 2600 ELO when I completely forgot about my rating, when I stopped caring about it. It revealed so much energy that I put mm. into work and actually working on chess. Like, oh my God, what do I do to reach that number? No, you just take all that time and effort that you think about thinking, how can I get there? I want that 20, just focus on what you're doing right now. And suddenly I was 20, and I remember this feeling because I was commentating the world teams 2013 and I check my rating and I'm 2608 and I'm like, how did that happen? I didn't, <laughs> I didn't follow it too closely. And then I was like, oh, I'm already 2600 and then 2620, 2640. And I was like, what's going on? You know? The moment I forgot about thinking about the number and the rating, exactly as Kosti is saying, I had no control over my rating. I had control over what I was doing and where I was investing my time and energy. Yeah. yeah. Responsibility. That's cool. Okay. Can we, can we learn? the uh the answer in this decision because we have two two uh, moves suggested one is uh queen takes f7 another move is rook a8 this looks very beautiful uh yeah two uh beautiful moves unfortunately queen takes f7 a very thematic idea because you get this like nice double check uh, white simply just doesn't doesn't get the the mate here. It's just simply not enough of an attack. Black can take the pawn. I think black can also go king g8 and, and be safe and yeah, basically surviving. Um, yeah, the other idea I saw suggested rook a8. Very strong. Nice job, guys. And um, actually, I, I just saw on the coach's YouTube channel that Jesse was doing a bunch of videos on tactics, which looked great. And uh, she had one on deflection, which I'm sure uh, it would be instructive to everyone. And this to me, I would call this like a double deflection because you are deflecting the knight on b6 away from defending the queen on c8. Uh, and we're also taking the queen away uh, from wanting to trade off our queen with the point being now we can go f takes g6 and not having to worry about queen takes e6 uh, in her mezzo. Um, and then someone was asking, okay, what will happen after h takes g6? And uh, well, the good question, yeah, yeah, it's a good question, right? To figure out how to like win this one. Uh, the way I think chosen in, in the game, or I'm not sure if, if uh, Black had already resigned, but was to take uh, with the queen forcing the king over to the h file, and then the classic uh, rook lift, rook f3, heading to h3, and that was the end of the game. Hold it yeah, and right 
the question was, can you take with the rook on f7? No, you cannot. Queen takes d5. Queen takes d5 or rook e4 is oh. even worse, oh. I think. Oh. Rook takes f7. Queen takes d5, yes, but rook takes e4. And then you have, you, if you take, wait a second, if you take the rook, uh, you lose the rook and you have to take on g7 first. And then you take, and now queen d5. And that's a win for black. Oof. Yeah. So no, uh, queen uh, checks first. I would say, yeah, if you can give a check, that should be your priority. Mm -hmm. And then you figure out what to do next. Mm -hmm. It was like rook f7 give lots of possibilities for your opponent. Because you don't really have an immediate threat, right? Hold on a second. After rook takes f7, if it's white to move, it's OK, queen g6 is the threat, right? But there's no too dangerous. Okay, and rook f3 check. Okay, there are it's checks the same coming. rook f3, rook h. Yeah. But if that's what you're trying to do, just take with rook. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> why would you delay that gratification? Yeah. Right. Can I take instead of h takes uh, g6? Um, instead of that, can I take queen d5? Hmm, that's a good question. Yeah, right here. Queen takes d5. Uh, queen takes d5. Pawn takes, king has to go to f8, and somehow that king. We talked about who's the worst blockader, uh, piece to blockade a pawn. We talked about queen, right? Uh, with, but the king is even worse. Uh -huh. and the queen, it's horrible. <laughs> right? So pawn takes, king has to go here. I would go uh, maybe bishop h6. I, I, know, I think you take on. I was thinking yeah, take on d5 and knight g5, but then you cover the f file and take my pawn on f6. Knight f6, yeah. Oh, wow. Oh. Bishop h6 is amazing. Oh, my. You had to see it before you play rook a8. Is that really the only move here? Oh, wow. Apparently so. What else can you do? If you take the queen, I thought takes the queen and knight g5. Yeah. But uh, it's. Uh, takes the queen, knight takes, knight g5. There are two threats, and the pawn on f7 seems well protected, but it's a misleading thought, like knight goes, or bishop wow. goes, and oh. if knight moves, the pawn is lost. So it's only bishop h6. Wow. Beautiful. Only. And if nice. queen takes, it takes, and, the, and now promotion. Now king g6, and now... This is where I usually just stop calculating. I'm like, okay, there'll be something. Is that a good strategy? <laughs> or <laughs> yeah, I would see that I have a perpetual queen e8, queen f8. That's what we talked about with Shirov, right? I would see that I have a check. King goes back, and I have a check. In the worst case scenario, I have a draw, but it looks that king on g6 is gonna be lost uh, somehow. Yeah, I think chess yeah. intuition is just so important. It's not something you can just read in a book and pick up. Maybe that just comes with experience. Unless, of course, there is a, a chess book on intuition, in which case, <laughs> where can I get it? <laughs> I need that thing. <laughs> yeah, For me, seen... it, would be, uh -huh. it, it would be very hard to go um, without a very, very long calculation, even at that position after king g6. Like, my knight is hanging out, thinking, like, oh, I think I'm a pawn down. <laughs> <laughs> I I always need to see the final final position. Are mm -hmm. Are you a perfectionist, Katy? Maybe that's oh. a problem. <laughs> Let's have a, a psychological session right now. <laughs> Blessing gonna curse. I don't, I don't know. I think I'm more like I just need a guarantee that it will be a, a win, yes. or I will just calculate some other way. Mm. Mm -hmm. From the yes, beginning, I'm talking about uh, at at the position when we're starting, right? This rook a8. It's very yeah. long, and yeah, we cannot maybe sometimes see it clearly. It's, mm -hmm. it's just complicated. Yeah. Now we know with sheer off, as long as there's a perpetual at the end, it's fine. Just go for it. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good advice. <laughs> because I will, I will always go for and, it. <laughs> and it looks quite promising. I would so not only if you see perpetual, maybe if you see some ideas like maybe he have seen perpetual and then he thought maybe I have knight c5 at some moment, you know. Mm -hmm. And here the idea is the knight can go to g3 at some moment, right, and join the attack. Maybe that's maybe that's the way to go. 
knight g3. Uh, there is check queen d5, but um, maybe you can hide with the king on knight g3 and knight is coming to the attack. That could be an idea, but you don't have to calculate it. You see that you have a perpetual and that would be good enough for me. Sometimes you just have to, to do a move that is good enough. Not the best, but good enough. Yeah. Here in the chat, we have a question okay. uh, about uh, can I really grow without a coach? Before uh, before you answer, I, I, I should share my personal opinion about that. When I, when I had a personal coach, I had really comfortable time and I had lots of medals. And the moment I started to, <laughs> to uh, prepare a game by myself, it did not went well that's my personal experience about having a coach um so what's what you guys think about this jesse oh um yeah i, I definitely it? think it, it helps especially with the discipline part like it's it's okay you can grow as a player without a coach but probably at a slow pace if you weren't maybe setting aside a study schedule but if you have a coach of course they have um material that they can issue you, guidance, and of course, just their expertise in identifying your problem areas and so on. Um, I almost made a, a bad joke, but I'm, I'm gonna keep it to myself. I don't, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> what about you, Kostya, what do you think? <laughs> uh, I think coaching is just kind of like the most, um, I think the only drawback is just the cost. I think it's like the most effective, most expensive form of training out there. Uh, you can definitely get to a really high level without a, a private coach. Um, but I think a coach does make it a lot easier for, for people and kind of shows them the way. Um, but I'm, I mean, I'm talking about the majority of players. I think for kids specifically, they do need coaching, I think, to really uh, improve in many cases. It's very hard for a kid to just sit on their own and like read and like not have someone they can ask questions. And so I think for, for, kids then the the role of a coach becomes much more important but if you're like a motivated teenager or like adult i think all the info is basically out there for you if you're self-motivated um but it you might struggle a little bit a coach kind of breaks it down for you shows you your weaknesses your biases what you're missing um where you're strong at what you should focus on all the stuff that would be kind of harder to figure out on on your own yeah i would also like to add that when uh, you can run, you can work in the wrong direction uh, if you um, if you don't hear any anybody else's thoughts or uh, you don't see your problems very often. Uh, sometimes yeah. people like from the side you can see so much more. Why aren't you doing this? And you're like, of course. Why I didn't see it? <laughs> because you were alone and you're in your box and you don't see what what you're doing wrong. So outside expert opinion is always good. Secondly, you would have a person that is really rooting for you and wishing you the best and you're not alone in that journey anymore. And that's like a huge psychological bonus, I would say. Yeah. So you know that you're not alone. You have a person that will help you, will listen to you, will do his best. You're not alone. That's, I cannot stress enough how good it is to know that you're not alone in, in that fight. And uh, secondly, even several lessons with a good coach can, can give you a, a proper guidance so that you know, okay, these are my weaknesses, as you all pointing out. The coach can really uh, tell you where, where you're doing it wrong and where are your weaknesses and how to fix them. And then he could give you directions like do this, do that, do that. And this is how you analyze your games. This is how you study tactics. This is what you do for positional play, end games, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and then you can go solo. If you, that's like uh, taking a um, coach in a gym, you know, like at least several, one or two lessons to know what is good, what is the proper way to, to lift stuff or, or take a coach for swimming. You know, you can try to swim on your own, but if you start in the wrong way, you just you're going to be swimming in not in a proper way at all. But even a few lessons with a coach can just give you a correct direction. And then you can say, thank you. I'm on my own now. Thank you so much. So yes, visit coaches <laughs> for coaches. <laughs> Coaches.com. <Well put>. Yeah. <laughs> Some uh, product placement here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's very well put. Yeah also keeps your insanity at bay. I remember, um, I mean, in the beginning when you're working with a coach, 
it's all it's all done you just you sit you absorb you listen but at some point you reach a you know the part of the relationship with your coach where you just kind of start fighting with them and arguing with certain lines maybe you're analyzing a game and you're like no but here and, and you said this and, and this so it's it's good to have someone to kind of discuss with as well and you're not alone like you said yeah i agree yeah all right i um, wanted to say something else but i forgot i'll come back to it so. <laughs> we'll circle <laughs> Yeah. All right, we have this banter <clears throat> cup happening here. Can yeah. we can we talk about this topic? Oof, I am so excited to see this clip. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um Michalo, you played against uh, Firuza. What how do you pronounce his name? Not one hundred percent sure. Firuja or Firuza, I'm not sure. Okay. Not okay. Firuza. Ali Reza is he's the only one Ali Reza out there that's that's the proper pronunciation, <laughs> Ali Reza. So yeah, you played against him in, uh, oh, it was this year, on the 28th of February. You played against yeah. Farouj in the Bansi Blitz Cup. And uh, you made some comments uh, during the game. And we're going to check out the clip as well. Um, I hope you guys have the stream open so that we can all watch it at the same time. So consider this our first chess, talks, uh, chess talk react video. Um, <laughs> you'll be seeing some original content right here <laughs> okay so uh shall i put the clip on yeah all right so we'll be watching the clip i'm gonna press play hopefully it'll be at the right volume um we're just jumping straight into it exactly as i suspected okay what are my chances after rook c8 bishop moves back to tanks do i have knight e5 ideas is that dangerous Knight e5, at least for blitz, that should be enough. Queen d5. Don't I have a fork or something? Let's say takes. Let's say fork. Rook d8. Oh my god. Oh, I blundered bishop e7. That's bad. Check rook d8, bishop f8. Should I get, let him give me mate? Rook d7, rook c8, bishop f8, bishop f8, rook d5, and mate. Ah. Uh, very hard. If I take on c1, it takes my rook and promotes. So I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna let him checkmate me. There you go. I still not a checkmate. Okay. Mm. I need some. All right. Brutal. <laughs> That's not the game I wanted to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> this was the timestamp of the game we're going to discuss. <laughs> oh my goodness. Ah, okay. I actually forgot that I uh, I liked the mate, so I let it happen. So Yeah, that was very honorable of you. Core to my... Yeah. It's not the most beautiful checkmate, but yeah, I blundered it, so I, I give it... Uh, let him checkmate at me. That's... Unlucky, unlucky. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's really good. He's just really good in, in Blitz. Um, so uh, should I tell what is a banter Blitz for our viewers? What is that? And that's it. OK. Yeah. What was it like playing for Uh It was very hard, of course, because he went on to beat Carlson. If I knew that in advance, maybe I would have relaxed a little bit. But <laughs> uh, I, I didn't like the fact that we had no increment. And I recently checked again our game. So the score, he beat me like 9-2 or something. So we, you were supposed first one to score eight and a half, wins the knockout, and then proceeds like in a World Cup, but, but a Blitz World Cup, basically. And uh, so you play a match out of best of 16. 
games. It's three plus zero, no increment. There's a whole tree knockout that he, he eventually won with Magnus Carlsen in the final, as I think most of our viewers have seen. So, uh, and he beat me like nine two. That was looked like a terrible score. But then I checked. Uh, I had several winning positions and I just lost because there was no increment and not very, I'm not so good playing without him. You can see it in the last game with Carlson. So they had this, this half fraction of a second per move and he just outplayed Magnus Carlsen in that, in that specific area. So, but uh, there were several games where if I, if we both had increments, the score wouldn't be so horrible. Let's put it this way. So I had a completely winning positions, but due to lack of time, I, I, I just lost. Uh, so this time the Banter Blitz 2020, which is in progress right now. Uh, so that one was 128 or a little more players and the regular knockout. That's it. There's a three, there's a knockout, and in the final turned out to be Alireza versus Magnus. So yeah, like when we say Magnus, we know who we're talking about. When we say Gary, we know who we're talking about, right? So let's say like Alireza, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Levon and uh, Hikaru and us, so first name basis, right? Uh, so this year they, they made it slightly different. Um, so there would be... Um, eight players can qualify to the super final where already Magnus Carlsen, uh, Timur Rajabov, Maxim Vashelagraf, and uh, I forgot it's number four. So eight uh, top players and eight people who qualify from eight groups. Basically, you have to win your group out of eight, eight grandmasters or players. Uh, eight people knock out three days. First day knockout, then you go to semi-final and final of your group. And the winner of the group goes to immediately the superstar tournament. So you have to win three matches. I'm starting on Thursday. But what I love about it, three plus two this time. It's three plus two second increment. <laughs> so <laughs> if I... For you. Uh, well, I checked my games with Alireza and there were several games where I completely outplayed him uh, on understanding of chess. But when it came to tactics, uh, mm -hmm. It's just we are on different levels, basically. But uh, when it came to positional chess or understanding uh, of pawn structures, um, the moment the position was closed, I was doing very fine, you know, until the position opened up, and that was it. Yeah, I um, um I saw this end game, rook end game was very nice. I think. Ah, was... the okay, he blundered a pawn, but then I converted it quite... The real, yeah, realization. But there was another game, I want to show another game that I actually won, it's just... I would be very happy mm -hmm. to have that game in classical chess, actually. Uh, one so question, how, how a chess player can get in this Bandra Cup? Like, how, how we can get there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, too late now. <laughs> it's <already in> <laughs> For <progress>. next. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, although I'm not sure, they are not revealing the, so the, now the group C is playing and there are A, B, C, D, F, G, H, uh, eight groups and they don't, so I'm in group E and uh, I don't know my opponents yet and I'm oh, playing on Thursday. Uh, maybe that's the point or maybe they are still uh, fi uh, filling in the slots. Uh, the, it said that uh, you either pay 300 euro fee and then they still have to, of course, do the... Ah, the, I forgot the main point of this. It's not just people playing Blitz. It's that you're streaming it and you're commentating your decisions and you talk into the camera. And that's why it's interesting. You can right. watch all kinds of Blitz, but when two play players explain their uh, what they are thinking, what they blundered, what they were doing, why, it's very instructive and fun to watch. So that's like the whole, the whole point of the tournament. And... Okay. Uh, so it was a 300 euro fee, but I don't think everyone could, uh, like what if too many people want it? I'm not sure what was the procedure. So the and prerequisite, uh, sorry, Mikhail, the yeah. prerequisite of participating in the Banter Blitz Cup is that you need to be good at banter probably. Yeah, apparently, yes. <laughs> uh, and you could have, so for example, I applied for, uh, they said special conditions for, for GMs. And uh, after Banter Blitz is over, I would be uh, doing a lecture for Chess24 um, in return, let's put it this way. So that was the bargain. <laughs> so I'm playing on Thursday and three plus two, and that wouldn't be best of 16 because it would be way too long. I think it's best of 10, maybe the first one to score five and a half. I I'll need to check, but uh, 
uh, yes, so less games because of two second increment. And knockout one day, knockout the second day, and the, the one who wins all the matches in three days qualifies. I think Sam Shankland qualified already. And uh, I forgot who else. I didn't follow it too closely. When I see my group, I'll start, I start preparing. But for now, nice. it's a secret. Ooh. Exciting. Yeah. But uh, it's only 64 people. <clears throat> so it would be really strong Grand Masters in each group. So the chances are very, very little. But if you win three matches, you're immediately playing Magnus Carlsen, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and what is the prize in um, the first prize is the winner gets 12,000 euros, I think. And uh, the one, uh, the, I think the knockout continues in that group of eight, but I didn't uh, look it up too closely. When I get there, I'll look it up. Uh, so, and uh, if you get there, it's like 750 euros minimum price and the winner gets, oh yes, 12,000. The second price is half of that, 6,000, then 3,000, then 1,500, and then 750 on, on, on each stage. So. Half of the players get 750, and then half of the remaining half, etc. So it's a United States style, where the first price is very high, the second one is twice lower, and the third one is four times lower, and it's <laughs> like the next is close to nothing. <laughs> so the winner takes it all. That's the that's um, the motto of the tournament. Is it like that, Kostya? <laughs> uh, I mean, a little bit. We have a lot of like uh, class tournaments. Yeah, and it'll be like first place under 1400 4000 dollars <laughs> second place 2000 1000 and then yeah it goes it goes down um but uh we'll often have a lot of ties i think at the top you know you get like five mm -hmm. out of six five and a half four and, and then half. you share mm -hmm. yeah and then you end up getting like 33 dollars <laughs> <laughs> like um because we also we split prizes in the u.s whereas in europe i think they do a lot of like tie rates here, mm -hmm. if you score the same number of points as any as someone else, you just split the prize. You don't get, care about the tie break, yeah? Yeah, which I think actually that was always strange to me because that kind of does seem like luck. Like, like what if your tie break score is better because your opponents had some lucky wins like later on, and then you just happen. Uh, I don't know. Well, I was a beneficiary. Uh, I placed uh, sixth once in the Reykjavik Open. Uh -huh. uh, which is crazy because it was like the 40th seat or something, maybe maybe much more actually. Uh, but the reason that happened was because their tiebreak system is based on a uh, number of wins. And uh, because I had kind of been doing like the roller coaster, I wasn't even having that great of a tournament, but I had like seven wins and three losses or something. And everyone else in my score group had a bunch of draws because they're like playing GMs the whole tournament and I'm playing like... <laughs> So I ended up getting sixth place, and I th actually I think they actually I think they share the the prizes there in Reykjavik, but like officially, like I was ahead of everyone by kind of like a weird tiebreak because mm. my performance was much worse. Yeah, we we actually had these discussions with other Grand Masters. What is the the fair tiebreak for an open tournament? I think number of wins is ridiculous because uh, um, because you can literally say the same. It's its number of losses. Mm -hmm. right it's the same tie break number of wins or number of losses you had three losses you had the most losses of all the other players that's <laughs> why you get the sixth place right so number of wins seems logical but when you put it in the number of losses that sounds ridiculous but that's the exact same tie break so and it doesn't make sense yeah you can lose the first two games and then the, you play you don't play against any strong players almost till the end then you win one or two games and you're there you're the winner of the tournament so number of wins i don't like it i don't like the progress because, um, uh, you know, when uh, they are not using it anymore. We were thinking that Buchholz is the fair one, but it's not very fair. I, I was thinking performance seems like a good one, where, where they basically it's average rating of your opponents. That's, uh, that's very fair. And then we came up with what is more fair than, than, uh, than performance is uh, because, for example, a player may have a fantastic tournament, but low rating, and you lost to that player. And he ended up beating everybody else. So, so then we thought that maybe the most fair um, would be to 
average performance of your opponents, not average rating of your of your opponents, but average performance, how they performed exactly in this tournament, not the history, the numbers they have, how they played in this tournament, and then average that out, and that would be the, as fair as you can get. So it takes into account how player played this tournament, and how, and uh, so that's that's the best I can give. But and, and it's, Buchholz is pretty good, but. But it's funny, is funny, the faces of three of us when you're talking about this math thing that you're so happy <laughs> to speak and we're like, mm -hmm, what? Yeah, I love math. Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm a yeah. geek classic. No, I geek. found it I I found it interesting to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that's cool. No, I was just thinking what they do at the Olympiad, because I mean they also do some kind of tie break with um performance rating and so on. Because you'll find that at the Olympiad, maybe some teams um, will be performing poorly as a team, but one member will be doing so well and then working out the board prize, what really happens. Hmm. So that's crazy. Yeah, I'm not sure about board prizes, but in the Olympiad, I think they made some changes because they had this system that they would, uh, uh, let's say if you win a match uh, for zero, you get uh, four times the, the number of match points your team has. So you can play very poorly. And then you win several matches for zero and your tiebreak is the best in the tournament. But you didn't play good teams, you just beat them badly. <laughs> so uh, so the, you can win, you can play the whole tournament uh, uh, beating minimally two and a half, one and a half. And then you play like one draw or something. And the other, uh, the other team drew the first match and then won the, all the other matches like quite confidently. And then you're not the winner, even though you were clearly playing all the strongest teams. So mm -hmm. this multiplying the score with which you beat the team by their um, uh, match, well, team and uh, number, it's like you cannot make, like any win at the end can change the whole, the whole setting. And it, I don't find it very fair. Because you just That's win weird. the last match for zero because you play some much weaker team and suddenly you're the best in the tournament, even though the whole history is erased if you win for zero at the end. <laughs> yeah, it's very yeah. volatile. I think the last two Olympiads have been decided not on the top boards, but on the tie breaks. Like I remember when the US won in, in 2018 2016. or 20, 2016, right? Yeah, yeah. 2016, uh, Ukraine was also having an amazing I know. tournament. Another heartbreak <laughs> of the U.S. over. Oh my gosh, Ukraine. I was there Sorry. in the final yeah. round as well. I mean, the manager of the U.S. team was running around with this little piece of paper, doing the math, being like, "Wait, <laughs> you need a draw here? No way!" <laughs> and he was obviously taking into account all the other games that were going on. And I mean, it was just crazy. So many teams could win. So yeah, so to like an American, the the idea that the finale can be decided on like board 42 like uruguay versus hungary or uh -huh. something like, <laughs> Wait, <what? laughs> like like a game between you know, like two random play like no, like no disrespect but like uh -huh. should be just decided on on the boards themselves and not on uh -huh. like these like yeah tie breaks so yeah i didn't think? follow yeah. with it too closely but indeed it was like one match the two let's say ukraine and usa i think first and second place in that olympiad right and their opponents played on some other board very low and uh, since uh, so so us won the match for zero or something and ukraine won the match so if that team wins or draw then it's then ukraine becomes a champion and like one game in that one board decides everything uh, yeah that doesn't seem about right because anybody had personal experience with uh, the the performance with like this with the per same, oh. same, same experience, no? Oh. I had similar experience myself, yeah. But it's with performance, you can tell in advance, right? You know by the rating of your opponent, you know exactly what would be your performance, right? Uh, I, I had a tournament in, uh, in Emirates, so uh, I didn't have a very good tie break uh, because I started the tournament poorly, like I lost second round and then I drew the third one or something, and then I won several games. And uh, the, the tournament was that there's a cutoff at place number seven. So first seven prices are, the first price was more than $10,000, Van Kao won the tournament. So here, uh, Krivoruchko plays Van Kao on first board. Van Kao has seven out of eight. And there are a bunch of players having six out of eight. And Krivoruchko plays Van Kao, and I'm playing on second board. I also has six out of eight. So, and the first price is more than $10,000. So really big money at stake if, if you win the game. So, but I was thinking, what if, what if a draw happens? I am white, I may offer a draw. Is it good or no? 
and the tie break was uh, Buchholz. And um, mm, I was half of the game. I was running around checking my my opponent's positions to see whether if they win or if they have a good position, I can offer a draw and then my tie break would be good. I didn't know whether to play for a win or for a draw and I was wasting time, right? It was ridiculous. And at some moment I returned to my board and then I see, that's it, draw is the best I can get. I'm in huge trouble <laughs> while running, uh, checking other games, I forgot about my own game. And instead I sat there and focused and I did manage to make hold that draw in a very bad position. Ah, so the, 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 the key was that first seven prices get the money and eight and below, they, uh, they uh, divide the prices American style. So everybody doesn't matter, eight or 12 or whatever, you get the same number. And the seven price was more than $4,000. And the eight was much lower and it was shared. So it was, that's it. So you have to go into top seven. And I barely made a draw. And then apparently all my opponents were playing against two other Ukrainians, Yefimenko and Kravtsev. So we were all fighting for, we, we all got six and a half out of nine. And half of my opponents were playing their opponents. And my opponents were playing black pieces and they were less rated. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and they had losing positions and they won, you know, it was ridiculous. <laughs> I, and I think my tie break was like half a point more than Martin Kravtsev or Yefimenko. So I got seventh place and eight and nine was Kravtsev and Yefimenko, my fellow Ukrainians. And that's it. I got $4,500 or something and they got like 700 or 600. Ooh. It was a huge number uh, in difference, but uh, that's my personal story of because I was wasting time and energy checking the games instead of trying. If I win the game, that's just awesome. I get a clear second. But uh, we ended up tied from second to tenth place or something. But yeah, tiebreaks could be just play the damn game. That's it. Let's just <laughs> focus. <laughs> yeah, good so, question from Ashwath here in the uh, in the YouTube chat. What do we all think about Armageddon as a way to to break a tie? And also another question. Um, about the new Keith Arkell book, which I haven't seen. Maybe one of you guys have, have seen mm. it apparently on Endgames. Sorry. Uh, but I, I know Keith Arkell is an English grandmaster, and uh, uh, England has a bunch of really good chess authors like John Nunn and uh, many others. So uh, I, I would imagine it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, Armageddon, I, I'm fine with Armageddon. You know, eventually the game has to end. So that's cool. I thought it was weird to decide a uh, team match with Armageddon. Um, like, if you're going to play another Blitz game, just have four people play a Blitz game. Or I don't know. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. like It can be tied. <laughs> like 2-2. Two, two. Yeah, oh my I mean, gosh. <laughs> it's... At um, Olympiad, it was... Um, uh, computer was choosing um uh, which board yeah the random mm -hmm. yeah. open board or women board and then captains were choosing the players and then a computer were choosing the color also oh by the way who what, what color would you choose white or black in armageddon yeah <laughs> black probably black yeah, yeah. I don't like have that experience I don't know I don't know because <laughs> yeah, you just need black, a yeah. draw right but I, I think Armageddon at least was incremented move 60 or something to avoid this uh, unreasonable knight versus knight or rook versus rook nonsense or stuff like that some increment at some point then yeah, black, yeah increment yeah. Yeah, yeah at some point I actually like the system that the uh the old US chess league used which is the the predecessor to the pro chess league which was in the final if it was four and four and it was a drawn match they would have the bottom boards play a blitz game and whoever wins would then move on to the board three player of the other team and basically the team that wins is the one that's like last one remains standing so if you win your game you you stay in if you lose your game the next board goes up and eventually it'll be board one versus board one, assuming both board ones like win their games. And then whoever wins that game wins the, the match. That's it. That's like, kind of like the Armageddon game. Uh, so I thought that was cool because then it's like, okay, both teams get a chance to kind of like play. And, uh, you know, even if you're down, you can still come back or like a lower rated player can pull some upsets. It's like, and then, oh, okay. It seemed like a good idea for a team, team competition. 
But that's a bunch of Armageddons, yeah? No, just normal Blitz games. What if draw happens? And then I think of draw... Um... Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> no, no, you're right. It, it was Armageddon. So draw means uh, black advances. I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's so yeah, it... multiple Armageddon, Armageddon for Armageddon, yeah. Do you know that there's rock, paper, scissors world championships? Yeah, this gets crazy <laughs> as well. That's an official sport. <laughs> oh my gosh. But I'm I mean, sure there's lots of psychology solved, right? there. It's not like uh, complete yeah. random people win, I would say. Yeah. But, uh, it sounds <laughs> really silly. I think really we should silly, do some but... more React videos. <laughs> 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 yeah. Maybe they use those same poker programs that say like, okay, if you show this person rock three times in a row, 90% chance <laughs> quite they're going to go paper. Quite <laughs> <laughs> That's quite oh possible. Or sometimes I know body language and stuff. So it's not online rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I remember in, in Big Bang Theory, which is like some sitcom with scientists, um, there's a there's a it. character in there who creates rock paper scissors lizard spark from Star yeah. Wars. <laughs> so there's so more elements involved there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there but is the point an is AI, the same. By the way, mm -hmm. sorry, there is an AI for rock paper scissors. If you Google it, the engine will play against you and it will start beating you. <laughs> what? It's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, like once you play enough games, it'll just start like analyzing your tendencies and just like. Yeah. yeah, you'll be totally... Yeah, so we're making fun, but it's not random. Yeah, you can beat you can be beaten badly by But the the way you beat the AI engine is you put, you you don't put any thought into what you're doing. Exactly. You, just random.org, random.org and that's it. You're fine. You'll get your 50%. <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. And I think AI already is playing way better poker than people do. I I, I read somewhere about that, so hmm. So it's not only chess problem that you can cheat in cheat in poker as well. There's card counting. Wait, not in, in poker. Do you get card card counting in poker? Or is that blackjack? No, no that's blackjack. No, because they because okay. they shuffle every hand so you can't can't count. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I find it weird that casinos forbid to count you the cards and they would kick you off if you count the cards. What if you do it by accident? <laughs> they still uh, kick you out just to be safe. Okay. There's I a story about, um, uh, I was studying in the mechanics and mathematics, oh my God, mathematics and mechanics faculty. And um, the dean of the faculty is a good friend of my mom, who's a scientist too. And uh, he told us, uh, me and my friends, uh, the story about uh, uh, a Lviv citizen, Lviv professor, who was really good in poker back in the day. Uh, and uh, maybe not in poker, counting cards. Yes, I think that was blackjack. So he was going to casinos when they were legal in Ukraine. Now they are illegal. And uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, gambling is illegal in Ukraine, but I think now it's legal again. I don't follow, I don't care. <laughs> so, um, so he was going to casinos, he was winning good money and they were kicking him out. Uh, so they have the right to kick you out for no reason because they see that you're just taking their income away. Just by simply counting cards, you know the odds better and you can beat the, uh, the dealer because the dealer doesn't do much calculation, right? He's just following the system. And if you know the, uh, the odds, you can beat it. So, um, so they kicked him away and he tried all the casinos in, in Lviv and uh, uh, tried to make changes to his face. Nothing like beard and mustache and stuff. No, it didn't work. And he Plastic moved surgery. to another city to continue his, his profession there. So you can't beat uh, you can't beat the odds. Yeah. So uh, don't make fun of rock paper scissors or blackjack or poker. It's all math and psychology. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, in some religions, um, it kind of forbids people to not well from playing chess because apparently chess is also some form of gambling. So is chess illegal in Ukraine too? <laughs> I wish I would be in national teams then because everybody, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. No, it's, <laughs> no, I'm yeah. Kidding. Hold on, weren't we supposed to check my game with Firuja? Okay. Yes, yeah. it's right here. It's ready for you. <laughs> <Is it right>? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so I'm guessing the question was uh, Banter Blitz series. What is it? And is anyone taking part? Yes, that's me on Tuesday, on Thursday. So tune in to root for me. Uh, so what can I say about Alireza? Uh, I think he's fantastic in Blitz. 
and in tactics and in uh, what's the, there's the coefficient as you see, you know on these online games where teenagers are the world champions where you have to like do lots of stuff per second activities i don't know any 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 game that is not chess where it's just one step for you there's uh, how many actions do you do per second and i think the best in the world in those online games do like from 10 to 15 operations per second in a game it's unbelievable like with the oh. with the shortcuts on the keyboard and with the mouse i think 15 is the number and uh, if you are older than 15 or more just due to biology you're not that fast anymore so the best online players of those games are teenagers just simply because of biology and they have 10 or 15 operations per second and they what? play for hours it's unbelievable so he has that number very high <laughs> operations per second okay. with his mouse <laughs> uh, but uh, with three plus two it's much less relevant right you two seconds is enough to make a, a move right so but it's if not you have too five weak seconds... to slow it's too old <laughs> to slow <laughs> All right. So, um, but I think Alireza uh, needs to improve his positional understanding of chess. And uh, for example, I'm going to show you this one win that I had against him. Yeah, let's see how to outplay Alireza. Yes. <laughs> Just take your notebooks and write down all the moves. <laughs> let's go. Where's my notebook? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I have it here. <laughs> oh, nice. I love it. <laughs> you put pawns in the center, oh right? Gosh. Three pawns, very good. <laughs> so I actually, it's, I, I'm actually delaying knight c3. Uh, usually people go knight c3 here, right? I think that's the most uh, played move here. But uh, I'm a big fan of f4 variation. And so I play f4 without knight c3. You'll see in a second why. So d5, e5, the position is closed. <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> so h5, there are other setups, but h5, it's usually the idea Black wants to, to develop the knight to h6, and then the bishop goes to g4, and uh, uh, all the pieces uh, develop uh, develop naturally in, in, in the position. Although Black doesn't have space. So I go knight f3, he develops the bishop, and that's why I didn't play knight c3, to have knight bd2. Idea, e6, and now I just simply take the bishop. So Black takes, and I take with the knight. I could have played something else, but uh, so the game went like this. He goes h4 to fix my, my king side. I develop the bishop, he develops the knight, I attack the pawn, he goes knight f5, I develop the bishop to d3, he develops the knight. So I have two bishops and space advantage, but what, uh, and I took the knight and he took with uh, this pawn. And I remember I checked his, his video after this, he thought that he had a good position already. When I took this knight, he thought that that was not a good decision of mine. He thought he had a good position because the pawn on h4 is limiting my king side, etc., etc. But uh, I had this exact pawn structure when I played 2014. We played a um, friendly match, Ukraine versus Poland. And uh, young Krzysztof Duda was uh, not as strong. He was 25-80 or something. He was a rising star of Polish team. And um, uh, so we played four against four match, and I managed to, to win against everyone, uh, including Wojtaszek. We won, I won all the games, classical games. And I drew this uh, with Jan Krzysztof, and I had black, and I had this very pawn structure. I knew how terrible it is. It may not look that terrible. He just took my knight on f5, and he had actually much worse version of uh, than I had, uh, than this one. It was so easy. He just, he just played b3, c4. And I had no counterplay whatsoever. So I had this experience. I had this pawn structure with black, and I knew how terrible it was. It looked good to me during the game. But when I played it, I, I had no plan. I barely survived. And I was like, oh, this, this, this boy is playing well. <laughs> and now he's, <laughs> he's 27, 50 plus. And then he was below 26. So he was lowest rated in Polish team in 2014. Hmm. So I just castled. And then I played b3, and then I played c4. So I have space. The pawn on h4 needs protection. He played queen d7. I, so clearly, he wants to castle long, because that's the only thing he can do now. Castling short just loses the pawn on h4. 
So, and I'm preparing that I'm gonna push my pawns when, when he castles. So he castles and now I close the position even more and that's it. I have a plan B for A for B5 and black is struggling with contraplay. So he went to rook G8, just in case I move my king to H2, you never know when the pin is gonna work out. So he goes F6 because well, what else? You know, I'm just gonna push the pawns and that would be game over, right? You need some contraplay. So he played F6. Played f6, and I pushed b4, and now he took. And uh, apparently b5 was good, but I just took with this pawn because if I take with the f pawn, suddenly the diagonal gets. I just love to open my bishop. Now my bishop is much better. It's no longer a bad bishop, and I have a great outpost for my knight on d4. And he still has no counterplay, so he decided to double rooks. Uh, Carpo style, rook g1, you know, so that I don't have to calculate anything. I just protect the pawn in advance. He doubled rooks. No, he moved the knight. <clears throat> yeah, that's I just... when you play this rook g1, I think mm -hmm. your opponent just don't don't want to play this rook g8 anymore because there's well, no h4 point. is hanging first of all, <laughs> but secondly, yeah, like uh, I'm just uh, uh, I'm trying to play so that he doesn't have any counterplay, and I know that uh, um, I had a I had a similar problem when I was a young player. If I had no counterplay, I would just collapse. So with H, I managed to figure out that, well, maybe doing nothing is fine. Maybe, I don't know, running with the king away to the king side. I don't know, but doing nothing very often is, is a good strategy. The younger you are, the harder it is uh, for, for a player to do so. And uh, so he went on to move the knight. I pushed the pawn. He moved the knight. I just pushed the pawn. He moved the knight. And clearly, he's going for G4, right? Knight G4 check. Otherwise, why on earth would he maneuver? The knight four four squares away, and in this in this game I made zero calculation. Only at the end when I when I when he resigned I needed to calculate something. Did so here I see knight g four coming. H takes pawn takes. I don't want to calculate that. I don't didn't want to calculate any. So I just moved my bishop. He gave a check and I just moved my king. And I'm just uh, sort of making fun of him. Like where's your counter? Oh, no, I wasn't <laughs> making fun. I was just trying to zero counterplay. Knight went to g four. Spent four moves. Okay, what's next? There's still nothing is happening next. He moved the queen, rook c1, c6, queen. I'm slowly improving. He still has no counterplay. Capture, maybe capture was premature. Maybe I could have prepared a little bit. He took, I put the rook to open file, uh, moved the bishop back. Knight is coming to d4. He took the pawn. I enjoyed it. Moved the knight <laughs> to the center. He came back. I love this position <laughs> for black. All the pieces look beautiful. I push c6, he went b6, I moved the queen to a6. And that's it, I can do pretty much anything right now, right? I'm completely dominating. I moved the rook here and I was, I could still, and I, rook c2, I'm preparing to double my rooks. I do double my rooks and then knight b5 is coming and then I played knight b5. And I was like, there must c7 should kill right now. He moved the rook to c7 and just resigned. And I was in the middle. Now when I needed calculation, now I needed to see that some capture is about to kill it. I can take the rook. Uh, bishop b6 would be a winning continuation. And then I guess rook a1 or queen b6 or literally anything else is just completely winning. So he just played rook c7 and resigned. And I didn't, I did zero cal calculation in this game. So, and uh, what, uh, what surprised me was that he thought he had a good position. Uh, I checked his stream here and I knew exactly that his position has no counterplay. I'm strategically almost winning already. So, uh, and I've seen some other games where uh, he's amazing in dynamics, open position, tactics, the speed of, uh, of, uh, of moves and calculation. But when it comes to a little deeper stuff, he's, there's still lots of room for improvement to, to hit the top level. So he's clearly top level in Blitz and Rapid, but for Classics, it's still a long way to go, in my opinion. It's interesting uh, when he changed his opinion that his position is not all right. It's just very bad. <laughs> Did you watch the stream? Uh, I know, I just watched that, that particular moment and I was like, what? He thought that he had a good position. Uh, maybe he didn't have experience with this pawn, but I had this pawn once, six years ago. So that's why it takes experience and time to, to get to know. He probably never analyzed this one. So that's why he didn't have this frame of reference. And I did. Yeah, so that's really interesting. For young Krzysztof Duda, yeah. 
<laughs> it did look, I mean, yeah, I would have also thought black is fine there just on first glance. Like, looks like he traded yeah. off bad bishop. Yeah. Close, like, what's the problem? Like, yeah. But no, that was really cool. Just detect the pawn on h4, b3, c4, as simple as that. And no, no counterplay from black, whatever happens. And that was it. Don't watch the other games. They are embarrassing. In one <laughs> game, I put the queen uh, where, on where <laughs> on c3, and he thought it was a mouse slip. No, it wasn't. I just <laughs> put the queen to a square that was attacked. <laughs> it was a not a mouse. It was the whole game. I played a great game. It was equal position, about equal. I just put the queen where it's under attack, and he took it. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> That's the worst. And he thought it was it's like unbelievable. And and yet I can I can play a game like this in the within same hour. <laughs> I don't oh. know. It's typical Sunday again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Well, that's tough. I like how you said you you barely calculated in in, in this game. Like it didn't require. Well, that's any. why I won. <laughs> just... The moment I started calculating, <laughs> it's just all ghost. You oh resigned before you had a chance to <laughs> to calculate. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is that. There's one famous game by uh, Gligrich where he won with black, where there was uh, no captures in the game. What? It was like a 40 move game. We yeah, need you to guys see can that. Google it. Yeah, I, I've I can, seen I recently. I've seen a quick. game. Mm -hmm. Recently, I've seen a game. The French defense. Similarly, all the pieces on the board black resigned. All the pieces on the board, like just resigned. Yeah. I think Classic. we have a topic for our next chess talks. <laughs> <laughs> How to win a game without any capture, yeah? <laughs> what a clickbait yeah, title. I'll try to find this game. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's so nice game. How how you get all these skills? Like, it's very positional, right? You were just thinking of um, every move. Where to look. Yeah. So you mean you mean my game or so the other yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. About your game. I'm still here. I'm still watching <laughs> the board. Yeah. Okay. Can you say that it's it came from uh, your own experience and also from some um, some classical chess games like you analyzed? Early. No, I didn't analyze classical chess as, as people may think. So I'm not a representative of Soviet or Russian or even Ukrainian uh, chess school. Uh, actually, most of our training was on dynamic chess. But when I, when I became older, I started to enjoy end games and positional play. And uh, uh, long-term strategies and maneuvers, I started to enjoy that. So... Uh, uh, people tell me that, that I'm a universal player, so I don't have any obvious problems in any in any of the area, but I'm not excelling in any of the areas either. So uh, uh, all I knew, I analyzed this third move f4. By the way, I recommend to play this one if you're uh, if you play against g6, bishop g7, f4 lines. Uh, to, delay knight c3. Maybe the pawn goes to c3. You don't know that, but the pawn goes to f4. Uh, so I analyzed a little bit and I knew the plan. So here it was just purely because Jan Krzysztof Duda showed it to me six years ago, what to do with white. And I just took that knowledge and, and applied here. That's it. That's all I did. That's your classics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe this is my immortal game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my yes, yeah what's your chess style? Uh, my style? Oh, that's a good question. I feel like I am a intuitive technical player i don't like to calculate i can do it i don't enjoy it i can do it <laughs> uh, i prefer to play on uh, intuition and uh, i mean i like attacking as well um but i would say i'm a more naturally inclined to like trying to get like a space advantage squeezing the opponent uh and playing in this in this style i guess my chess heroes are like people like kramnik aronian Maybe Carlson as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And what about the banter levels? From mm -hmm. one to ten, banter levels. So you get you get the the chess style and then banter style. Very important. Yeah. What is a banter style? Yeah, I'm not yeah, following. It's, <laughs> it's it's okay. Just just ignore me. I'm making bad jokes. That <laughs> We're too old for that. I guess. <laughs> it's okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And what's your style, Jeffy? 
Um, mostly hope chess, you know, <laughs> playing hope a chess? move. Yeah, so it's like playing a move and, and hope it works. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I like uh, more attacking tactics, open open games. I'm less of a positional player. You mentioned Aronian, um Kostya. So you like yeah. uh, his English games? I think Aronian is a genius player. Yeah, I mean, he's very good with English, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I like, um, so my heroes would be Tal, for instance, you know, just reckless sacrificing. Probably also oh. intuitive, but uh, not not as uh, the, the intuition that doesn't work rather than the intuition that does. <laughs> what about you, Katty? Uh, I think I'm more positional chess player, but I also enjoy tactics. I think um, it depends on the mood I have on that day. Yeah. yeah, I think it's just about um, the mood I have that particular day or just what I need for, for if it's a last round. But more I enjoy positional chess. Like I, I think it's more beautiful. I don't know why I think so, but... Yeah, positional chess is great. Karpov. <laughs> Oh man, what an artist! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you you feel all the piece. Um, you feel all these squares. You're going and I don't know. I, I feel it's more beautiful rather than tactics. It's it's strange. I would say there's a lot of correlation between a chess style and uh, the personality of a player. And uh, with personality can change with time. So, for example, you mentioned Kostya Kramnik. Uh, he was extraordinarily dynamic in the 1990s. Unbelievable combination, sacrifice. And then he just switch, and I'm going to play Catalan, and I'm going to squeeze the water out of his tone, and I'm going to outplay you positionally. And then at some moment, he decided, yeah, I'm just going back to playing dynamic chess. So he he's an absolute genius in both of those things. So yeah, you have to be a genius to beat Kasparov anyway, right? So <laughs> he describes his um, playing style as a universal. Like I enjoy this, I enjoy that too. Yeah, I think these days if you want to be a top player, you have to be universal. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be like I can think only maybe Hikaru Nakamura was not a universal top player when he was firmly in top five in the world, he was not universal, I would say. But he had to he had to add Queen's Gambit decline to his opening repertoire besides mm -hmm. King's Indian at some point because you cannot play King's Indian all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can't only play good chess on Earth. You must be able to play good chess on the moon and Mars and the other planets. <laughs> I feel like uh, Mama Jarov had a similar transition. I feel like he was known as really like dynamic player, but then like last couple of years, he's just like one of the best prepared players in the world and super solid and technical and like winning end games. And... Yeah. Yeah. You have to be universal. Otherwise, people see your weaknesses and they can just adjust. If they are universal players and you're not, they can find lines and openings that just don't suit your style or, or go to positions where they know you, you're performing worse. That's why it's quite interesting to me how come Caruana has a poor blitz rating. It's 27.10, his blitz rating is. 35th How poor is in the that? world. <laughs> Sorry? How poor is that, right? Oh, no, that but I mean, he's, he's amazing <laughs> in rapid and in, in classics. And OK, 11th in the world in rapid, I'm just checking. And in classics, well, we all know number two for years now. Yeah. And somehow in blitz, he's not good, even though He's constantly in time trouble, so I'm not sure. I think this might be a controversial opinion, but I think the best blitz players in the world have a natural gift for like tricking their opponent. And I don't know if like I don't know if I see that in Fabi, like that instinct to kind of like make a dubious move but trick his opponent. Mm. Um, I think he does make dubious moves, actually sometimes even on purpose, but not in like that tricky blitz sense, like you know. Mm -hmm. I think you guys know what I mean. <laughs> uh, I feel like he's like a very like correct, nice guy. So he doesn't have that like killer, killer so spirit. So wait, if you're a nice guy, you can't play good chess. 
I think you can't <laughs> like yeah I just don't see him um you know like because I think he's like very concrete right so he's just trying to calculate everything out um Whereas there might be opportunities to just kind of like catch the opponent, maybe take a risk and trick them somewhere. I'm totally like just making this up as I go along. It's just my personal <laughs> feeling. But yeah, there, there must be a reason why he's not uh, like 2850 with, with the rest of the guys in Blitz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I understand Grishchuk is always in time trouble, but he's amazing in Blitz. Yeah. Uh, Caruana is somehow not not as great as as in other aspects of chess uh, do we have one more game to uh, sure yeah i uh pasted this game in now and this one without changing the piece this yeah this uh -huh. was a game yeah that uh yeah legendary so does our gligorich one um without a capture he's playing black in this game and uh, we get like a Rui Lopez. And uh, yeah, very opening is very conducive for uh, closed positions. And eventually white plays uh, c5, d5. And now like the maneuvering battle starts mm -hmm. b4. And I think this is where maybe Gligorich starts winning the game. He was starting with this last move, g6, kind of preparing this kingside plan of eventually uh, breaking with, with f5. Of course, Gligorich is known as a King's Indian player, so this was, um, I'm sure, very natural for him. White goes h4, knight h7, h5, knight g5, queen e3. Uh, and now a fantastic move, f5, just kind of blowing everything open. And the position is so sad from White's point of view. Everything's so passive and, and awkward. Now f4 is a huge threat. E f5, g takes f5. Black just keeps control of everything. Uh, queen a7 was played. Uh, just trying to get out, f4. Knight f1, rook a8, queen b7. And then rook e7 was Ouch. the last move in the game. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. 29 moves. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> when games play themselves. So, yeah, that I think the Grish would have done well against uh, Firuja. <laughs> 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 yeah, if you're playing Firuja, just close the position and you'll still lose, but at least. <laughs> that's oh my gosh. <laughs> kind of advice. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Here I was actually <laughs> listening. I was like, okay, I'll close the position. <laughs> if I ever get a game against Ferruja. Is it, <laughs> is it better to I... lose in, in 60 moves without any chances or in 25 moves with some chances? Ooh. Of course, I'll take I the some know. chances, but I want to last longer at least. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like beginners, when they play like in Simul against uh, like Grandmasters, I lost it four and then they say the number of moves. And then in that case, it's better 60. <laughs> if you really stand no practical chance whatsoever, then yes, just the number stands for itself. But if you do have chances, it's better to, to take the chances. Otherwise, you lose without playing, basically, yeah. Mm -hmm. But don't just go like, you know, E3 or E6 and d6 in the opening and just like try to <laughs> so yeah i'm not gonna lose in the opening here <laughs> so how not to a beat the 2700 challenge them in king of the hill or some other chess variant by tricking mm -hmm. them <laughs> i never played any of those variants never literally none it, of those it's fun is it fun it's a lot of fun yeah okay yeah king of the hill is fun for sure Highly recommend. I, I'm not. I don't even know the rules. You have just a bunch of pawns, or what's that? You have to get your king to one of the center squares, so the first one wins. Okay, never played it. Well, yeah, it's like all the same rules of chess, except if the if the you goal put your is king different. on the okay. center, you win. Yeah, legally. Yeah. Uh -huh. Legally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so allows for some some nice combinations. I think Danya is a big fan. Um, 
you know, some nice sacrifices. You get your king to e3, quiet move. Opponent can't stop king e4 or king d4. <laughs> winning combination. Yeah, yeah okay. winning combination. <laughs> <laughs> the bond cloud played correctly. <laughs> oh, I remember um, Irina Bomaga was streaming. I think it was her was streaming. Um, um, I think she has something like Friday with Irina. Irina, and she was playing a game, and she had completely winning position, like completely winning winning position, like I don't know, five pieces um, up or so, and she made final move king e4. Uh, and she got zero. It's like, oh, what's what's happening? <laughs> what happened? And then people in in the chat room, that's that's the rule. If you get the king on e4, you lose. It's just like, oh, I wish I knew it earlier. <laughs> you lose. So oh, ridiculous. that's a different. That's uh... Interesting. <laughs> it's like inverse. Yeah, yeah, right. Wow. <laughs> I played other version. Have you any of you played the? I'm not sure what's the name, like Magic Chess, or I don't know what that is. So let's say if you put a piece on the B and G file, it turns into the knight, and if you put it on A or H file, it turns into the rook. Mm -hmm. Although it the piece itself is not changing, but it can move as a rook on A and H file, as a knight on B and G file, as a bishop on C and F file. Any piece except queen and king can change so you play knight h3 and that's a rook have you ever played this game that's trippy i wouldn't try no it's so fun okay oh, wow. <laughs> so I, would, I, would I would enjoy that. those games as well okay <laughs> <laughs> i also played uh this cylinder chess have you heard about that cylinder chess no it's like if you take a you know back in the day we had uh, the boards that you take it with you to the tournament that you can like roll into a cylinder right so so you put your chess board and you make it a cylinder and then you put your pieces like this so same starting position but a and h file are connected to one another so oh. you play on a cylinder not on a on a table so a1 and h1 squares are adjacent to another i heard that's the kind of chess they play um it was aliens playing that movie arrival i don't know if you guys have seen arrival <laughs> No. <laughs> random reference but yeah that's okay. the chess that they play in that movie <laughs> oh my gosh i love this one it's like a and h file are one so you go with the king to h3 and then you go to a3 on next move mm -hmm. and then you come back to h2 and then you so the the board is connected so the if the rook is standing it's uh, so rooks are protecting each other in the starting position mm -hmm. And it's That's really cool. fun to play because the diagonals are weird. All the diagonals are the same, the, the eight squares. All the diagonals have eight squares. There are no mm -hmm. short diagonals anymore. Okay. Is it possible not to win at all? Uh, I was thinking about that. Can you give a checkmate with the king and rook? If the board is circled, the king keeps <laughs> running away. I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> you have to cut it off vertically, I guess, and then you checkmate, right? So it's oh not connected gosh. on the first and eighth ring, but it's connected A and H file. And what it's about so... bishop and knight? No. No, no chance, of course not. No, you just oh my run gosh. away. No. <laughs> There's no correct corner. There are no corners. <laughs> There's only the edge of the board. There's no corner. <laughs> Oh my god. Yeah, it I reminds see. me um, of this one picture of Usain Bolt. It was like a motivational picture. So it had a quote, and Usain Bolt was playing a game of chess, but there were no kings on the board. So he, he couldn't lose because he didn't have a king. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't win either, but that's another topic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Um, can we discuss our next game? This is yeah. Ryszewski against Petrosian. Oh, yes. Let's get that one up. And this was game of the century, was it? No? This mm -hmm. is one of the famous game, right? But yeah, I think Game of the Century yeah. belongs to uh, Fisher. Was the other one. Okay. So we don't uh -huh. have that one with us. Which is the game Which you made is? me feel really bad about not knowing? Because oh, far of the Oh, that one. Okay. Was that a world championship 
match game. Yeah, let me ask Twitch and YouTube chat. I mean, you guys are at various levels of chess knowledge. How many of you guys have heard of the game Kasparov Topalov Wykonze 1999, aka Kasparov's Immortal Game? Can we actually check that one instead of? Also, the people yes. who say yes, they've seen it. Are you above 2000 ELO? Yeah, fair question. I, I read a question on Twitch when I explained the rules of magic chess or the cylinder chess. Does it require you to take LSD? <laughs> <laughs> I think that I'll, I'll give yes. you this one. Uh, so the rules of those games are itself difficult. So even playing one move is hard. And then at some point, we decided to connect these two cylinder chess and magic chess so that A and H file are the rooks and, the, and then it's cylinder. And you're like sitting with, in one position, like, which piece can I capture? That's like, the question is <laughs> even hard to answer. Right now, what can I capture right now? Not attack. Back to not, basics, yeah. <laughs> back to basics, exactly. And we were like sitting five minutes on the move. This is woof. <laughs> so yeah, you need LSD apparently. For <laughs> the answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> Have you guys if tried chess out? chess is not difficult enough for you, you can go ahead and play these versions. <laughs> uh -huh. Have you tried the 5D five, five chess? 5D chess? 5D chess, it. uh, yeah, exists. What is uh, that? It's uh, a version of chess that involves uh, multiverse time travel. Okay. Yeah, I played that on stream once. And you start with like some tactics to see how it works. So, for instance, knights can move back in time. Or if you checked, you can move your king to like a different dimension. So that's really, really cool. Yeah, that actually sounds fun if they like pulled it off i i would i would be willing to try that mm -hmm. hmm. does do every world champion have their own uh private immortal like if they did it well like if the game like makes sense and it's like fun and yeah it exists it does exist no no, no i, I i've oh. seen it i know it exists but like oh. i'm i'm hoping that they like made a good game because oh. like because if it didn't work if it was like weird or if it, like you know it's hard to play that would that would be unfortunate it's it's definitely hard to play. <laughs> That's just me. Yeah, I think chess is, itself is very difficult. For me, Fisher chess is difficult. I'm just looking at the position. Mm -hmm. I cannot evaluate. I have no clue what is going on. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I don't think that there are lots of people who say that uh, Fisher chess is the future of chess. I don't think that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think... Uh, if I cannot understand the position, how can the general public understand what is going on? So uh, unless you make it something ridiculous, uh, uh, I don't think it's going to catch on because the game itself is difficult. Even with engines and commentators, it's still difficult to explain to, to broad public what is going on. In Fisher chess, it's like nobody knows what the hell is going on <laughs> until a position looks like the one that could have happened from a real, from a regular right. game, then I can evaluate. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm like, who's better? I don't know. Maybe it's a win. I don't know. You know? <laughs> so there is no frame of reference. I don't know what to compare it to. It's like I'm confused. So how can people follow it that know only the rules of chess? I don't think there's future behind it, unfortunately. Oh, OK, <laughs> <That's> too bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I really want it to be the, the case that Fisher Chess is the future, but I don't see it happening. If our goal is to, uh, to broaden the audience, I don't think that's the way to go. Simplifying the rules, that's the way to broaden the audience. So that make, make it simpler to understand. Like, like any sports, like you, you check, you, you understand that was a mistake immediately, right? If a football player kicks the ball and doesn't hit the, uh, whatever, that's it. Oh, he screwed up. Everybody knows uh, and people can have a beer and discuss. I would have done better. That's not the case with chess. Yeah. I know there was a competitive checkers. I don't know if that's the thing, but then they, they solved checkers. There was an AI yeah. that solved the game. Um, yeah. So what happens if they ever so solve chess? Do you think that's possible? Oh, that's no, impossible. Impossible. I immediately can tell you that yes. Oh. The the number of uh, um, possible iterations and number of games 
is beyond the number of at uh, atoms in uh, on Earth or or even universe by different measurements. So it's impossible. So for example, the Nalimov table base, Nalimov table base with six pieces, I think it has uh, a few hundred terabytes. I think that's if you want to download it. There's the Lomonosov table base with seven pieces. Uh, so it's exponential. Like with six pieces is this number, with seven this number, with seven pieces is this, and with eight pieces it's like. Mm -hmm. So maybe they would figure out eight pieces, uh, but nine, I think, is impossible. It's beyond the capacity. Like, even if it was solved, there's we physically cannot store it anywhere on Earth because there's not enough. Even if you store one position in one atom, it's still not enough atoms on Earth. So mm -hmm. that's, no, it's never going to be solved. I mean, luckily, they detected life on Mars. So if we ever make things <laughs> that way, then... Yeah, maybe if we take Mars and then hold the solar system and then... <laughs> there we go. <laughs> put hard drives there. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Storage space. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yet. I'm, oh, don't I'm worry. Sure it will not get solved. Okay, that's good. Because then all the books... Everything, all the players, yeah. what would happen? <laughs> so, um, I don't know, have we gone through the game yet? Because I just saw the end. So that, that was a whole spoiler. Um, Katty? <laughs> yeah, I think we can go quickly. Okay. Which one is this? It, this is the Ryshevsky, uh Patrol. Ah, okay. okay. Oh, I just Googled Nalimov table base. Five pieces is seven gigabytes. Just do the mess with me. Seven, five pieces, seven gigabytes, six pieces, one terabyte, already 140 times between five and six. And okay. seven pieces, hold on, I'm still Googling it. Let me get my it's calculator. Lemonosa. It's still loading the number. <laughs> <laughs> Let me grab my calculator quickly. 140 terabytes is the um, seven piece uh, Lomonosov endgame table base. Oh, so 100, 140 times the six pieces. So it was from five to six, it's 14 times more. From six to seven, it's 140 times more. And from seven to eight, it would be uh, 400, uh, hard, uh, 10, 10 times more than the previous step. So from five oh, to wow. six, it's, it's uh, what, 14? From six to seven, it's 140. And from seven to eight, I'm guessing would be 1400, not 140. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. still, it's still within our capacity, but one more step and that's, uh, there's a one zero. It's not one zero adding, it's zero, zero adding to the, uh, to the ratio, not to the number. So yeah, actually, it's interesting. Like when you first hear about engines and how they calculate like millions of moves a second, you think like, how have they not solved chess? Yeah. But then when you like start counting how many possible moves, like twenty moves on on your first move, twenty moves for the opponent, four hundred each, four hundred each, sixteen thousand, sixteen thousand, or one hundred sixty thousand, and then it's like, oh, how do computers actually calculate anything at yeah. all? Like the the branches goes infinite. Yeah, if they were calculating literally all the moves, the depths would be three or four. <laughs> that would be the depths when it has to make the because it runs out of power. So so they they eliminate the moves without considering. So they 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 have inbuilt like the stockfish, for example, the neural networks. I have no idea how they do it. Just like us, I guess. We have no yeah, idea they, how we do it. So. They prune, yeah. <laughs> I mean, some end games are theoretical draws, and the engine will still show like plus two or minus two for that. Yeah. Why does Not that anymore. Happen? Stockfish Twelve was released uh, this week, and it has that problem is gone now. So they, they took the Stockfish and the evaluation function of a neural network, and they uh -huh. connected it to one another, and that's it. That problem is solved. Yeah. Have you used it, Mikhailo? You've noticed any difference? Yes, it's just way better. So way better. I had a selection wow. of positions where Stockfish 9, 10, 11 just had no clue what is going on. Uh, half of those positions, uh, Stockfish 12 is figured out. Wow. The AI is taking over. Yes, careful. It's time. Don't give them too much power. Yeah. <laughs> the robots are taking But it's not AI. It's just the one fixed neur network, neural network that just evaluates the position. So the stockfish mm -hmm. is still, the algorithm is still the same. But as far as I understand, the stockfish is 
calculating some lines and then at the end of each line it has to put a number to evaluate the position and before that that number was assigned uh, in advance so like if the bishop has so many squares that's this number if the knight has so it was all predetermined in advance and now it's all being uh, delegated to the to the neural network and it gives the assessment from its uh, uh, capacities and, and does it uh, also like choose which moves to calculate because stockfish's problem was always that like you know it doesn't understand that an idea is like possible or likely to work or thematic it just calculates mm -hmm. everything so often like miss sacrifices so yeah, it just doesn't yeah. really it just doesn't understand that like bishop takes h7 and knight takes f7 yeah. these are like typical moves to check does it do a better job of like looking at those moves now yes Wow. Yeah, you can check some positions with Stockfish 12. One of my positions that had uh, that happened in my game and Bishop H7 is the fastest Stockfish with billions of positions it considered. It didn't see it. It thought it was losing. The moment I play it, it gave zeros. The moment I play another move, it says, oh, of course it's winning. But it was not <laughs> considering it. Uh, but that was the problem. You had to help it. Now it seems uh, it, it can, and at least that particular position it managed to found. But still oh. not all of them. You still have to. You still have to offer those moves. That make Does sense. the engine um, improve itself, like as you're using it, if you're finding these moves? No. I mean, does it remember? Uh, yes. Yeah. I if mean, you take move back slowly, it will remember. Yeah, yeah, fast. yeah. When you take back yeah. your move, then it's your, it's his, or its first suggestion. Okay. But if you press left slower, slowly left. If you go click, 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 it forgets for some reason. Oh, I don't know why. okay. Goldfish brain, got it. So let's say you, you found the, the problem, Stockfish didn't see, and then you slowly come back to the position that is actually of interest to you, and then it would memorize that, and then it would give you a better evaluation, yeah. Okay. So Stockfish 12 is way better, just download it, it's way better. Interesting. And what it's gonna Lila? get better because they would, they would uh, I, it, I think it's Leela's ne neural network that they use to oh. evaluate all these positions, but it will get better with time. So they just, uh, if the neural network improves, they just change it and the stockfish will change itself better. So yeah, that's... Yeah, because the last one I heard of was Leela and Alpha Zero. So I don't mm -hmm. really know what happened to, to those. <laughs> yeah, Leela is the um, Alpha Zero. Uh, oh, is it improved. the same thing? Oh, oh, okay. It's better. Okay. Better already than yeah. Alpha also. Zero was retired by Google because that was basically their little science project. Uh -huh. yeah. And and then chess enthusiasts kind of used the same idea to create Leela Zero, which is now like no. One I of think the they gave engines. the code away, but they didn't uh, give the network. So they said, "This is how we did it. Mm. You mm -hmm. can go ahead and do it." So the 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 point of Stockfish, you just download one small file and you have Stockfish and it's not changing with neural network, it is learning itself. So they said, this is how we started the learning process. And then we used our supercomputer and we're not giving you that, we're just giving you where we started <laughs> with. And enthusiasts started to teach it. And now it's one of the second best or even the best engine in the world, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I get Stockfish, which is the latest one, 12? Yep. I will be 2,800. So where can no. I, where can By I By the end of this? the year. Okay, got it. <laughs> I thought your goal was 23. Oh okay, yeah, <laughs> sorry. I mean, after the talk, it's going to be 2,900. So it's just climbing here, my goals. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. All right. Did we see the game? Did I miss it? Yeah, let's see the game. Let's quickly see Yeah, it. we can Who's quickly in charge? see it. Yeah. Oh, we have not so much time left. Wow, yeah. time flies. Sorry, anyone can show it, I'm sure. Oh. Yeah, well, yeah, so this is the game uh, Ryshevsky Petrosian mm -hmm. from way back when. I think this was from, uh, is this from the Zurich Candidates? Yeah. The big, the big famous one? Mm, it was played so. in Zurich. In uh, nineteen fifty-three. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. I just checked the notes. No, I, I, I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, be, that was my that favorite uh, tournament from Zurich. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. 
So I'll just take things to the, the critical uh, moment. I guess this is one of yeah, Petrosian's most, most famous moves uh, of his career here, uh, playing black uh, against uh, really talented Sammy Ryshevsky from, from the States. And um, I guess Petrosian's trademark was his uh, level of defense, right? They called him Iron Tigran because he would lose very, very few games uh, every year. And uh, it's almost like he would defend positions before the opponents even realized like they were winning or they were, they were better. Um, he would just come up with a way to uh, make sure that he's not, he's not losing. So in this position, I mean, black feels worse. White has the two bishops and these uh, central pawns. And uh, now that white has defended the, the pawn on uh, e5, he wants to play uh, e6 at some moment, maybe even d5 if given the chance. And uh, well, here comes Black's next move, uh, just truly fantastic move, Ricky Six. Um, now it's not just a, let's say strategic sacrifice or he's not just like offering the Rook up because he wants takes, takes and he controls all the light squares. Uh, the move improves Black's position as well because he's opening up uh, the Knight coming to E7 and then using the D5 square. And this is now something that White has to, has to think about. Uh, but Michaela, I think you had some very strong feelings about this, right? That White didn't have to take this rook uh, ever. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, you can uh, you can just ignore that rook, and or you can take it. This is still still uh, still uh, advantage for White even with that exchange down. So modern engines really questioned the. Uh, that's the best move in the position, because otherwise Black is in huge trouble here. White has two bishops and the center and the king side attack. And so black is in trouble. So rookie six is a good move and 97 is coming, but white is still still uh, much better whether white captures or not. Um, so yeah, let's see if you analyze this one with the modern engines, they would uh, say that white is, it's not like it's equalizing or, or anything. It's just a great positional sacrifice, but white is still, still much better. It's the kind of move I think, um, I mean, save the game for him. Petrosian like held very easily. And of course he does this a lot in his career, like sacrificing the exchange just to control some key squares and get positions like this. Yeah, where his minor pieces are just like kind of outplaying the opponent's heavy pieces. I think a lot of people though, they do need to develop like kind of a better sense of danger where I think a lot of players, they don't want to give up material basically until they're forced to, until there's just like no other option. So if you have like a difficult position, I think many players are just going to play whatever they can to avoid losing material until they're just getting checkmated. And then it's like too late to do anything else. So uh, it takes some real skill, I think, to actually give up material uh, as a defender before things are so drastic that you're actually just resigning if, if you don't do it um, at that moment. Mm hmm so yeah it seems that white so uh, the, the game continued with a4 right mm -hmm. and yeah. this is the idea is to improve the bishop right just the bishop wants to get out to a good diagonal apparently if white were to focus on the king side uh, like with rook g3 uh, and then and then uh, uh, and then h4 and stuff rook f1 bishop c1 just focus on the king side not that diagonal the other black is in 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 big trouble after after move like rook g3 for example knight e7 takes takes queen uh, queen to g4 the pawn is hanging and now now if black goes knight d5 which was the destination now there are multiple problems on on the g file uh, h4 h4 h5 is coming so you you cannot do that uh, you cannot do that uh, anymore Oh, wow. Queen g4. Oh, sorry. Rook g3. Yeah. Rook g3 takes takes rook f1, let's say. Rook f1 is the better move here. Just improves the rook. There's nothing to see on the e file anymore. And on knight d5, you go queen g4, and uh, uh, black, is, uh, black is paralyzed. Uh, on the g file, h4, h5 is coming. Um, the bishop is about to, to go to c1, and uh, black is in trouble. Black is still very solid. But it's not like black equalized. So white with one move a4 managed to uh, to lose that one. But it's it's also a natural move. It's hold on, Botvinnik Capablanca, right? A4, bishop a3, mm -hmm. bishop goes through a3 with the winning combination. Uh, so maybe they had that uh, game in, in memory. So the bishop joins through that diagonal. But it turned out to be not a good decision because of 97, and that's the the good one. 
now suddenly black is doing very fine when yeah. in doubt play a4 got it Katie, are we <laughs> taking notes i don't know <laughs> <laughs> Just, yeah, it's a typical idea for classics. names, though. That's what I think. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? You yeah, Butvini Capablanca. <laughs> Check that game. I Butvini mean... Capablanca. <laughs> same of similar pawn structure, Butvini Capablanca. You should check that game. I'll stop, I promise. Okay. <laughs> yeah, too bad Petrosian didn't win <clears> this <throat> game. That would be a, an instructive, really great moment. Yeah, like a critical moment, he gives a sacrifice and then he seizes the initiative and wins when fortunately it was just a draw. But the 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 idea for if you've never seen this one, this looks amazing. Yeah. But once you've seen it, you like take it for granted. Yeah, of course, d5 square, knight is coming to e7. What else can I do? But for many people, it's just just mind blowing. I, yeah. I think it's because of Mitro, uh, Petrosian that this is now like a normal, normal idea. Like, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So we take it for granted, you know, like Philidor position. When he came up with the Philidor Rook end game, everybody was like, what? <laughs> but <laughs> for now, we take it. Come on, children should know that one, right? So, yeah. Or like gravity and, and Newton with physics and everything we take for granted. And now, yeah, Rook E6. Can you imagine studying rook end games in the 18th century and trying to show people like, look, you can't beat me in this position. Like, I don't, I don't care, Francois. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Oof. I'm in lonely day. <laughs> <It's funny. laughs> Those after comments. Oh my gosh. Cool. Well, yeah. So this is the most important moment of the game right critical position yeah this by the it. way it maybe it's because rookie six was shocking for Reshevsky that he was like what he gives me material i'm gonna give it back and so uh, when my opponent surprises me with a good move that i didn't see i immediately start playing poorly don't tell anyone please <laughs> <laughs> oh my god so that's exactly what happened rookie six what you know and then a4 mistake and then black is very fine yeah that's actually true that's actually true <laughs> perpetual stalemate in the chat says i kind of hate newton for gravity we'd be flying if it wasn't for him <laughs> <laughs> that is funny yeah <laughs> We would win right, Rook and Games if it was not Philidor, yeah. I think um, we can finish this stream yeah. for today. And uh, we can show more gravity positions <laughs> next, <laughs> next episode. And some more beautiful games and stories of chess. Yes, yeah, please visit CoChess. Uh, There's still 50% uh, off for premium coaches if you want to become better at least a few lessons can really boost your uh, your improvement mm -hmm. yeah i like these uh okay cool this was a lot of fun and i i learn a lot uh, during these chess <laughs> talks i really really do it's such a privilege being here with all of you and uh yeah you must have a great evening further and costa it's probably still morning where you are right I don't know. My day is just getting started. <laughs> oh man, what time is it there? Uh, it's twelve thirty. No, that's great. I'm gonna be uh, streaming on uh, Chess Dojo Live in about half an hour, and then oh, awesome. yeah, we got our Sunday show. So yeah, it's gonna be great. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah, be no, uh, the last lurking guys. over there. Then awesome. Go check them out. <laughs> all right, thank you guys. All right, thank, thank you, you all. thank you everyone. Thank you.